It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat and Mary Jo Foley are here with a very big show. We're going to talk about progressive web apps. We're going to, oh yeah, we got a lot to talk about. A big scoop from Paul Thorat came in over the weekend uh, all about what is ahead for Windows 10. It's a big year. Paul. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thorod and Mary Jo Foley, episode 556, recorded Wednesday, February 7th, 2018. 90% cacao, 10% PWA. Windows Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV, the fun and entertaining way to sharpen your IT skills. Visit itpro.tv slash WW and use the code WW30 to get a free seven-day trial plus 30% off a monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. And by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash windows. And by WordPress. Make WordPress.com your online home. Plans start at just $4 a month. Go to WordPress.com slash windows to get 15% off your brand new website today. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show where we cover Windows Weekly. Hmm. With Paul Thoreau. <laughs> it's an, uh, okay, it's an obvious name. We could have done something clever, but what the hell? Paul Thoreau is here, Thoreau.com. He's the author of many books at LeanPub.com and a astute Microsoft watcher. Mary Jo Foley is so astute. Her blog <laughs> URL is all about Microsoft.com. <laughs> and uh, between Mary Jo Foley and Paul Thoreau, I think we got the, got the bases covered in occasional appearance by Brad. Oh, Oh, look, it's By him a as a fireman. fireman. Oh, it's pajamas. Opie, the little kid from um, he does <laughs> Mayberry. Look like Opie. <laughs> is that Brad? <laughs> That's Brad when he was little. Aww. I keep trying to tell Brad that he doesn't have to share everything. <laughs> and uh, he just doesn't, uh, he doesn't listen. Just goes with it. That's pretty cute, though. <laughs> He'll be really, back. That's where we're going with that one. He'll be back. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I love my team. That's all I can say. Fire Marshal <laughs> Brad says, we're okay. We're go for Windows Weekly. All right. Uh, 2018, a transition year. How so? Why do you say that? Why do we say that? Who said that? Did I say that? This is you, Paul. <laughs> I, think, you. I think you perhaps said that. <laughs> Let me just... Well, yeah, so um, from the there, was a, there was a massive leak of information over the weekend uh, regarding Windows 10 and um, kind of a revised on Therat.com, oh. may I yep. point out. A big exclusive. This, this yes. is why I'm um, glad I'm a premium member. Yeah, a lot of misunderstandings about this thing, too. I, I was kind of, it actually wasn't, I was going to say humorous. <laughs> actually, it was kind of sad um, yeah. to watch people kind of completely misunderstand what's happening. But as we know, last year, Microsoft. Maybe it's Try. the big bonfire picture that you put. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's supposed to be a dumpster fire, but I was trying to be polite. Um, oh, geez. <laughs> no, no, I, no, to be honest, I should say right up front. Um, I think that what they're doing is smart, and I think this is necessary. And, um, this, you know, I and took, this info comes from your sources? This info comes from uh, a massive cache of internal documentation. That were inadvertently left in the backseat pocket. And within my uh, eyesight <laughs> and uh, <laughs> burned into my brain. Okay, good. Yeah, um, so you feel confident that this is, uh, this is the plan? Yeah, like 100%. 100%. So, um, by the way, I, I well, I should say, um, obviously there are holes in the, in the sense that there might be other bits of information tied to this. We don't know how Microsoft intended originally to communicate this publicly, right? But we know, what we do know is that last year, Microsoft released at least two new versions of, or I should say product SKUs or product editions of Windows 10. Um, I've often argued for the fact that they need to have less, you know, rather than more of that stuff. Uh, one was that Windows 10 Pro for workstation SKU, which is aimed at obviously high-end workstations. Uh, and then the other one was Windows 10S. 
which was ostensibly aimed at education, but really wasn't relegated just to education. The point was they were they're trying to streamline Windows in a way that will allow them to get rid of legacy technologies over time. Um, the problem with Windows 10 S, you know, as I've said so many times, is that it, it wasn't a process. It was just kind of a hard stop. And that I think most people would agree we need to get to that thing. But the way that they did it was perhaps not the best approach. But the, the other aspect there, though, is I think there was some confusion about what this thing was. You know, and, and it's, you know, people like us who follow technology or follow Microsoft uh, in particular would look at the Windows product lineup and try to slot this thing in somewhere. Where is this thing? Is it like a Windows 10 Home with some extra stuff? Is it Windows 10 Pro with, you know, minus some stuff or whatever? Um, the terminology that Microsoft eventually came up with was that it's a mode of Windows 10 uh, Pro, that it's this thing is Windows 10's Pro, but it's running in this mode where we were artificially cutting off certain capabilities. And that's a very accurate way to say it. Um, you might have noticed that no PC maker shipped a single non-educational Windows 10S based computer last year. In fact, I would argue that no PC maker shipped a educational Windows 10S PC last year. I don't believe there's any evidence of a single or, uh, educational institution adopting that platform and rolling it out to any degree. But So whatever. who bought this then? Nobody. Can I say something here? Because um, I remember, yeah. where was this? Ignite. Mm -hmm. Microsoft said they were going to be Windows 10 SPC starting at 275 coming out from a bunch of partners. And they listed Acer, HP, Lenovo, and Fujitsu. Did yeah. those just never ship? No, no. So the the big confusion, and what you're referring to, by the way, are educational computers, right? These aren't things where you would go to a retail store and buy them. It, these are educational PCs. Well, they called That's them. The first thing. Um, they called them Windows 10 S devices for Microsoft 365 F1. So first line worker. Oh, okay. Well, remember those those ones? Yeah. They were kind okay. Of yeah. I don't think those ever. Oh. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying they don't exist. Worker? What is that? That means somebody's not good well, enough to get a real computer. Yeah. Like, you know, people who are in customer service. <laughs> oh, frontline. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't, people no, I don't get me wrong. I don't mean to say that they're not offered. What I'm saying is I don't think these things ever sold to any degree. We've never heard one success story from any school or, in this case, uh, enterprise no, customer true. or whatever right. it is. I think that's that's adopted yeah. Windows 10. It's just never happened. Yeah. Um, the one mainstream computer that ships with it, of course, is Surface Laptop. Um, Microsoft, very conspicuously when they talk about Windows 10S, by the way, even internally, <laughs> do not give any data for Surface Laptop uh, conversion to Windows 10 Pro. I believe it to be very close to 100%. But, you know, that's my yeah. opinion, whatever. Yeah. Um, so I think, obviously, a strategy change was needed on this thing. And again, I want to stress this because, I'm, you know, Mary Jo and I joke about this, you know, um, because I'm so critical of Windows 10S. I, it's important <laughs> to... Re well, no, I, I, but it's not black and white. Like, I, I, I do believe that this is the right vision for Windows long term. I did, the, the, the exception I have with it is that hard stop thing, that they they aren't allowing people to move into it more, you know, more gradually. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, uh, this is a little uh, kind of a side tangent, but uh, I was thinking about the life cycle of um, versions of Windows that cannot run the Microsoft Store apps, um, which meaning Windows 7 and Windows mm -hmm. 8.1. And when do those when do those products fall out of support? I think for Windows Seven, it's uh, what twenty twenty, yep. if I'm not mistaken, January twenty twenty. And then yes. for Windows Eight One is what twenty twenty three, five years yep. from now. Yep. Um, it occurred to me while writing about this other thing we're about to talk about that that would be the time frame. That should be the time frame, um, because Windows Ten S, as we're calling it today, relies on Windows Store apps pretty much or verified apps essentially, but. This platform is designed not to run the old stuff, or it's limited so that it cannot. That would be the that would be the right time frame, right? When I say that we need time to get from here to there, there there it is. The, five years. It would be that's a perfect time frame uh, to phase out support for desktop apps. Phase them out with the desktop operating systems that can only run those apps. You know, um, but whatever. That's just a, a side. But I think that will thing. never happen. Yeah, no, of course not. But. But that's because said, of know, enterprises, right? Oh, there you go. Okay, that's a good point too. Um, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, I live. Listen, I live in a a white tower. You live in a bubble. You, yeah, you live yeah, in this no, weird I bubble. <laughs> I live in a in a fantasy land where everything works the way I want it to. That's that's true. Um, I do wish the world was a different way than it is. Um, 
But, you know, the, the one thing that's kind of marked Windows 10 S, it's only been around for like eight months. It's not like we've been suffering through this for a long time or anything, but uh, <laughs> it is uh, sort of a, a lack of flexibility on Microsoft's part. You know, I've argued in the past, like, you got to give people the ability to run that one app that they need or to install the drivers that they want for their printer or their scanner or their mouse. You know, Microsoft's own mouse, the Surface Precision Mouse has drivers that are only <laughs> their desktop based. You can't install them on a Surface laptop. Uh, which is crazy, unless you install Windows 10 Pro. So, uh, anyway, I've had my opinions about that, and I've made my arguments for doing certain things. But um, I would say that this uh, transitional year thing, which is the subject of that article, part of it is this flexibility, that kind of newfound flexibility on Windows 10s, right? And so, Windows 10s as we know it appears to be going away completely. And what they're going to do instead is allow each mainstream version of Windows 10 to run in this mode that um, businesses can optionally enable this for their um, users. PC makers can optionally ship PCs in that mode, but not just Windows 10 Pro. They can do it for Windows 10 Home, which might be less expensive. Um, the other issue with Windows 10s, well, <laughs> One of the many other issues with Windows 10s, I guess, is that the upgrade to Windows 10 Pro, which is what has been the case so far, has been a temporary condition, although it hasn't gone away yet. They've already extended it at least once. You know, in other words, when they announced it, they said, look, you know, whatever the time frame was, six months or whatever, you can upgrade to Pro for free. And at the time, I was like, look, you gotta if you're going to ship this thing called S, you got to let them go to Pro for free all the time. You can't lock people into this because... What will happen is six or seven or nine months down the road, someone's going to go to upgrade and it's going to say, hey, this costs whatever the price was, $50, $100. And it's like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, it's like I want to run Chrome or I want I just bought a new printer and I want to install the drivers. And now you're telling me I have to pay you more to be able to do this thing that Windows should just be able to do. It's not, it feels like kind of a gotcha, you know, and I, I always felt like that was going to be kind of a sore spot for future upgraders whenever that time frame ran out. Um that's not actually going away on Windows 10 Pro. Um, I actually don't know what the deal is on Enterprise, although I think the way Enterprise licensing works is if you buy a version, you can buy different versions of Windows, or I should say licensed versions of Windows that do or do not have downgrade rights and so forth. I don't think that they would ever artificially constrain or prevent uh, enterprises from switching from S to Pro, you know, nor do I think they would charge extra for that, but that I don't know. But the thing that's interesting and new is that for Windows 10 Home, the cost of that thing to PC makers is the same. So if you get Windows 10 home, uh, home in S mode or Windows 10 Home not in S mode, no cost difference. And if you want to go, for, if you as an individual buy a computer, which you might do on a low-end computer, right, to a, to a normal person, a $279 or you know, $400 computer, whatever it might be, uh, if you get that thing in S mode and you discover you can't install Chrome or iTunes or the drivers or whatever it is, you can upgrade to Pro uh, to Home, sorry, for free. And there you go. That 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 actually does answer one of my big complaints about Windows 10 S as originally envisioned. So um, can I throw in some things about Windows 10 S? Not yeah. to defend it or anything, but um, <laughs> yep. I don't know if you remember this. La last July, I went and looked it up. We were at um, the Microsoft Partner Show and I came, I remember you were, you were, you came for a day or something and I said to you, guess mm -hmm. what? Windows 10 S is actually a mode of Windows 10 Pro. And yeah, they started talking said, about it that way. Yeah. What? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. I said, Windows I think I, 10 what S I argued at the time was that it was the opposite of that. I, I, yeah. I, so I said Windows 10 Pro is a mode of Windows 10 S. Yeah. But actually, I've come to, I, my original assessment the, was in, the other way. Right? Yeah, the, yeah. The way they describe it is, is very good yeah. and it is correct. So uh, what was interesting was they never really publicized that, right? Like they told mm -hmm. me that in a meeting I went to and they said, well, you know, the real name of Windows 10 S is Windows 10 Pro in S mode. And I was like, it is? They're like, yeah, it's just Windows 10 Pro locked down. That's what it you is. You know, they, they could have solved a lot of problems <laughs> by communicating that on day one. I know. Because right. once you understand that that's what it is, it starts to make sense. It does. And then at, at Ignite, when they announced mm -hmm. Windows 10 S um, with the Windows 10 Enterprise in S mode, I remember saying to the guy, "Wait, so is are every is every flavor of Windows 10 going to have an S mode?" And he said, "Well, we've only announced Pro and Enterprise." Um, <laughs> but then they, I also heard about you know them talking about Windows 10 S powering things like kiosks and and signs. So I'm like, so there must be also a Windows 10 IoT in S mode somewhere. 
Interesting. And then, you know, and then Microsoft accidentally let at the end of last week when they were announcing the bug bash quests announced right. um, there is a Windows 10 home in S mode. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. Pr prior so to that, by the way, there is. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, prior to that, maybe a week prior to that, they had released yeah. a build of the inside oh, yeah. preview, which I installed. Right. And mm -hmm. I said, well, it's interesting I, because I'm testing it on Windows 10 S and on Windows 10 Pro. Yeah. And when I up, I had heard, remember, there was a little bit of confusion a few weeks back or a month or so ago, whatever it was. Some uh, insiders had installed uh, the new build at the time on Windows 10 S. And they said, hey, this thing says Windows 10 Pro now. Did this yep. screw up Windows 10 S? I'm trying to run Windows 10 S. Yeah. And Microsoft yep. said, no, it's just the desktop branding thing. Don't worry about that. If you try to yeah. run a desktop app, you'll find that it behaves as it did before. And they did. And that mm -hmm. was true. And it was like, okay, yep. they'll probably tr change it back to S in a later build. Yeah. Um, uh, again, I don't remember the exact details, but a couple of builds ago, let's say, I installed the build on my S test machine and mm -hmm. I saw that it said Windows 10 Pro in S mode. And I said, well, that's interesting. Okay. And I, I wrote an article at the time where I said, I think they've just changed the name of Windows 10 S, you know, um, <laughs> to this thing. Yeah. Um, it's actually that they went public with the name that it always was, but but never made but it clear that that was the name. But they're also expanding it. Yeah, they're expanding it <laughs> yeah. to, to more versions. To um, home, right. So, so, yeah. So, well, yeah. Right. so there's all that Windows 10 S stuff, right? Like, I, f I don't feel like it's Windows 10 S going away. I feel like it's just Microsoft cl being clear, finally, about what Windows 10 S is, right? Well, okay, but if you, if you were to look at... Yeah, you're, uh, yeah, I would say it's it's almost like uh, Windows 10 S V2, you know, or something, you know, yeah. you, you could kind yeah. of think of it that way. And it, mm -hmm. and if you look at from the moment they announced Windows 10 S through, you know, the end of the year, the beginning of this year, yeah. there are various little milestones where they kind of adapt things, right? So one was right. um, the frontline worker piece that you were talking about, which actually I had forgotten about. Um, yeah. One was when they extended the timeline for people who were going to get the free upgrade. They, they've mm -hmm. kind of been adapting it over time. And they if you have. think about it going to home in this case and possibly, I don't know anything about the IoT stuff, but I, you know, you could kind of see this mode being applied to different things. Mm -hmm. um, and you combine it with a new flexibility on the upgrade, right? Um, I think for a SKU like Pro, which is always a lot more expensive than home, mm -hmm. uh, it makes sense to uh, charge the user at some point for that upgrade, right? Yeah. As long as they understand when they go in that you, you do have some amount of time to get that free. Yeah. I love that they've added the ability to make it free for home users. You know, we often complain that yeah, the home, home users are, are kind of screwed. They're the ones mm -hmm. who, you know, are guinea pigs for testing Windows updates. Yeah. Um, it, it does seem like they have been left behind uh, a lot of the times. And the other, this is a little, we'll get to this maybe a little bit later. There's some other stuff going on with the home SKU, which I yeah, think is Yeah, I want to get to that. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, I think it's, it's important on a number of levels, right? Because, yeah. right. Uh, sorry, I, 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 uh, we often think or worry about Microsoft leaving the consumer market, right? And I think the Home Pro, the Home Pro, the Home SKU speaks very specifically to the consumer market, to end users who would walk into a Best Buy and buy a computer. But mm -hmm. it also speaks to kind of higher end consumer things, yep. like gaming, especially, um, right. where all of a sudden they're turning home into something that is not just more applicable, but is in mm -hmm. fact going to be the go to choice. Right. So those, when you uh, when you guys customers. published. Well, you, when you published all this information, so here's what happened, by the way, a little funny backstory. So Paul dumped all this information on a Saturday morning. Like I was sitting there eating breakfast, looking at my um, Twitter account. <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden I'm like seeing all these articles start popping up and I'm like, what, where is this coming from? What? <laughs> <And> guess who? <laughs> That's funny. I know. And so then, then I'm like, okay, I need to, I need to take a shower yeah. and think about this. So I went, thought about it in the shower, came back out, and I'm like, you know what the biggest thing in this whole thing is to me? It's what they're doing with home. The and, home thing, yeah. I later wrote a separate article about this for the same yeah. reason. I, the more I thought about it, yeah, I agree with yeah. that. Yeah, because yep. right now, what what do we have in the lineup? We have Windows 10 Home. That's all we have, right? That is the only edition of Windows 10 for home consumers. Like, I mean, a lot of, yep. even a lot of like, we were talking about this last week, a lot of businessy type PCs ship with Windows 10 Home right now. That's what it comes installed with. So what Microsoft's doing, it seems from what you guys wrote, is they're saying they're going to go to the OEMs and say, guys, there's not just going to be one edition of Windows 10 Home. There's going to be this Windows 10 Home in S mode, which we'll give to you. Well, we won't give it to you. We'll charge you way less if you put that on a machine. Then there's Windows 10 Home as we have it now. Then there is going to be this Windows 10 Home Advanced Edition that is well, going to okay, be so more the, expensive. The question, though, is... 
uh, it more expensive to PC or to PC makers, right? So PC makers, the, right? The, this one is actually not clear. We know we know that today, with Windows 10 Pro for workstations, that cost is given to the user, right? It, you as a user, you buy a 16 it core is, something and you want these on. capabilities. You, yeah. you can upgrade in the Windows Store and get that. But it's yeah. I, I looked again and again and again to try to understand how this was going to apply because the pricing information is for PC makers. Right. Uh, and by the way, we don't get that data a lot. That, that yeah. alone <laughs> makes this documentation kind of incredible because we never really see what you know right. the actual price of Windows is. Right. Um, and we see it here. And it's it's very interesting. We can talk about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, it is not clear to me that a user could go to the Windows Store, mm -hmm. the Microsoft Store, and upgrade from home to home advanced, or if home advanced mm -hmm. is just a mode, <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, I, because you I, as a PC maker, God, I'm yeah. sorry. No, no, because I, I remember we were talking on Twitter because as, as Paul's publishing all these stories, I'm like saying things to him on Twitter, like, wait, so what is this thing? And what is this thing, right? And so um, when you publish a thing about Windows 10 Home Advanced, I said, oh, so Windows 10 Home Advanced is to Windows 10 Home the same way that Windows 10 Pro Workstation is That's to exactly Windows right. 10 Pro, right? That's, I should say thematically, right? What thematically, we don't know is if it's a, a, a separate SKU like Workstation yep. is. Um, it's not clear. Uh, and I, I bet it is. I, need I bet to, it's... I, I know. And, and what are the feature differences? That's, that's something else we don't know, right? Like, what's different well, between actually Windows that we, 10? Yeah, you know, you know which know. PCs it can run on, right? Well, in other words, what it does is it takes advantage of the types of PCs that would have... Uh, that gamer gamers would use, right? Yeah. Not just gamers, but the gamers is the easiest thing to understand. What that means is... Um, core i9... And Siri just kicked in because I use Siri every day. Um <laughs> A core i9 processor. If, if if the system is a core i9 processor yeah. and you're a PC maker, you're going to want to mm -hmm. ship this version of Windows or some pro version, right? Because it will right. take advantage of that thing. If you have a core i7 with six or more cores also, mm -hmm. it can take advantage mm -hmm. of that. Uh, or Threadripper, or the AMD equivalent. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I don't have it here in my notes, but there's another um, instance. I believe if, if it is a machine that has more than... I think it's any core i whatever processor with more than 16 gigs of RAM, if I'm not mistaken. That one's off the top of my head. Also, would I think would require essentially advanced mm -hmm. home advanced right. to take advantage of that hardware. Yeah. So and I guess so the question is, well, the that's like is, Windows you, 10 Pro for workstations. That's it's exactly that's how they like do it too. Yeah, it's exactly right. So yep. it, it's easy to look at this and say, well, as a PC maker, you would ship a gaming PC that it would meet these requirements. Mm -hmm. You would ship home advanced. It is specifically targeting that market, by the way. Um, I think it. I don't even think it's like you would. I think you will have to. I do too. I do too. Yeah. But it begs the question, though. People can build these computers, so right. What about uh, system if builders? it's not a, yeah, if it's <laughs> or just a person, you know, as an know. individual right. building a gaming PC, like I did a year ago, and I think Brad is doing right now, mm -hmm. um, or is. Kind of, I don't know what he's doing, but um, uh, you might want I know this what thing. He's doing. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, or you might need this thing, right? So yeah, the choice right. today is you would typically a gamer today would buy, would get Windows 10 Pro. Right. Uh, in the near future, you might say, well, maybe they would need the workstation SKU because that's mm -hmm. you know, even though honestly, yeah. it's not really targeting that market. Uh, this kind of opens up home. As mm -hmm. either a SKU or a family of SKUs, which yep. hopefully the former, not the latter. Um, to brand new capabilities. And it's also tied into a broader strategy at Microsoft when I talked about that transition year. Actually, the, the core of this is not so much about Windows 10 S. It's about uh, Microsoft looking at what has worked in the PC industry over the past couple of years. Because you know the PC mm -hmm. sales have fallen for six straight years. Um, there have been sub-markets within the industry that have done well. And there's two of them, gaming PCs and then non-gaming premium PCs. Mm -hmm. um, let's apply that that marketing push, that success, the the strategy, and bring it down to the volume part of the market, which is low end yeah. and mid range computers, and that's what this is about. You know, in other words, mm -hmm. let's make this, let's make all of these things compelling across the board. I think S mode is a way to bring what used to be Windows 10s uh, to computers that can compete with Chromebooks in any situation, mm -hmm. right? Not just in the educational market. And I think Windows 10 Home Advanced is a way to make Windows uh, a no-brainer for gaming yeah. PCs, which it kind of already is, obviously, but now focus more on the consumer skew, not on what used to be essentially mm -hmm. the business skew.
But you know, but what I'm interested in is with Windows 10 Pro for workstations, there are some features that Microsoft stopped putting in Pro and only is putting in that SKU now, right? So yeah. for example, the ReFS, the file system, right? You have mm -hmm. to get Pro Workstation to get that. What are they going to do with Home? That's what I wonder. Like, is there going to be oh, any feature I, in Home that is not in the base Home SKU, but it yeah. is in advanced Home? I didn't see any evidence of that. I I, uh, I believe it's just the core, the processor RAM combinations that I mentioned earlier, and I mm -hmm. and for that reason I agree. I, I think it's this is going to be basically a requirement. If you're shipping a PC like this, you're going to need Home Advanced. The rationale yeah. behind that is it costs more, right? Um, yeah. You can get like basic Home on a, a, a low end four gig computer with 32 gigs of storage or less, mm -hmm. small screens. It's going to cost next to nothing. But if you get if you build one of these computers right. with a Core i9 processor, a six core, you know, a six core Core i7, mm -hmm. yeah, you're gonna have to pay about four times as much uh, yep. because that, you know, computers are much more powerful. One one um, reader asked me, and I thought this was a hilarious question, but no way it's not. Um, he said, "Hey, if we get the home advanced SKU, does that mean we won't have to take the upgrades automatically from Windows going forward?" <laughs> I'm like, "Right, yeah, that's a good on, question." But <laughs> yeah. I don't know anything about that. I know yeah, we don't. That, know. Would, that would be nice. I sure. I know. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I thought that was really the to me of all the parts of the, and there were so many parts of this that was the most interesting. I'm like, oh, so they're looking. Yeah. So and you understand why they're doing it, like you just said. They Microsoft's going to get more money by doing this, right? So instead of having people building these expensive, high end, mostly gaming type rigs with Windows 10 Home, now they're going to get more money out of them per copy of Windows pre installed on those machines. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I get why they're doing it. Makes sense for it's them. A lot of it's a lot of information. It, it's it's kind of hard to understand. Like you mentioned, uh, re re R E F S or whatever, right? This yeah. is the uh, Windows 8 era file system that the Sanofsky guys kind of came in with, and it was yeah. going to be everywhere, and then it's kind of departed. You know, um, yeah. I'm sure they still use it on server, or whatever. So now it's available only on the workstation SKU. Um, fine, mm -hmm. okay, whatever. I don't believe that's coming to home advanced. By the way, I don't yeah. think that makes any sense for that particular product. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, you know, they've always had kind of an artificial line dividing each of these mm -hmm. SKUs, and it is going to be interesting to see whether it's literally – because the way these things kind of stack up, it's it's really based on the capabilities of the computers, and it's a tiered pricing model. Mm -hmm. um, I, my, I, I, my hope, and, and I, I half think that Windows 10 Home Advance is not going to be an extra SKU in the sense that I sort of think to the end user what they're going to see is just Windows 10 Home and it will just expose the capabilities of the computer they have. Hmm. And that what they won't understand is that the PC maker may have paid a little bit more depending on the capabilities of that computer. Um, I think I, know. I think the opposite <laughs> is going to happen, though. Yeah. <laughs> just um, ample just because, precedent just for because, that. No, just because they did that with Windows 10 Pro for Workstation. So I'm like, they're probably going to do Home Advanced, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But maybe not. We that's one of the I things we don't hoping, know. You know. <laughs> I know. Just keep hoping. I like, you know what? Right. We call you a pessimist on this show, but you're actually an optimist. Well, I have um, realistic expectations, but high hopes. <laughs> I think <laughs> is the way I would say it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know okay, I mean. uh, there's but. one other thing that you guys wrote about that I would like to talk about, but I should have gotten my gong out before, but I don't, I don't have it handy right now. But um, there's yep. a, there was a mention in this document about 60, Microsoft says 60% oh, of I, users. See, I wasn't even going to bring this up. I was literally going to let this one go, but you, you had to bring it up. percent of users stay on Windows 10 S, only 40%. Currently, are upgrading to Pro, and they said this is on third-party devices running Windows 10 S. If they do upgrade to Pro, they do this. Uh, Sixty percent of them do this in the first 24 hours. So, I know you said this is like a laugh, but you know what? I think these numbers are real. If you include oh, the Surface Surface laptop, it'd be they, in, completely the it opposite. It doesn't though, right? Exactly. For obvious. Third-party devices. Is, so, I, I have two two points to this, and you might want to grab your gun. Um, this is the this is the part where I said they literally provide no information about their own computer that runs this right. system, Surface Laptop. This is it is to this day the only mainstream PC that ships with Windows 10 S. When they announced this computer, Terry Marson said he fully expected to see several P, uh, premium PCs from third party PC makers in market by the end of last year. Obviously, yep. that's never happened. Yep. I, I, like I said earlier, I believe that the conversion rate 
to Windows 10 Pro, and that system is 99 point something percent. It's got to be as close to 100 percent as something could be. And I but think it's about for, 50. Okay. <laughs> but but <laughs> you know. here's why. Here's why. Like this came up with people started arguing about this on Twitter over the weekend. This this was the stat that got people like riled, right? And okay. the reason I think this is a, a high number is who, where did they ship third-party devices running Windows 10 S? First-line well, workers. Uh, in education. And education. Who, the who education. controls if you are allowed to upgrade on those devices? An administrator. That's right. So, so here's the problem. Yeah. But I but I, this is why I feel that this these numbers are real, like you say. In other words, that yeah, in this real. field of these devices, I do I don't believe mm -hmm. I don't think they're lying. I think this these are real. No. It, well, I will absolutely admit to that. But this number, the number of these machines is so small it doesn't matter. And what I mean by sure. that is when when they announced the computers that were 279 last summer that were going to run in yeah. education, and then again this past month when they were at BET and they announced another round of computers from some other companies like Lenovo, which will also start at 279. The one thing they didn't tell anybody was those computers don't actually come with Windows 10 S. Those computers come with your choice of Windows 10 S or Windows 10 Pro. That's how they're presented to education. You don't have to get them with S and an upgrade. Mm -hmm. You have a choice. I don't think anyone is choosing S. I, I, and, and again, I don't mean this literally, but statistically or, you know, whatever, however you want to say it, I believe that the vast majority, if not all of those computers, are in fact going out the door with Windows 10 Pro. Mm -hmm. And then there's the I'm, first line of workers. Okay. First and, line workers also, or front line or whatever they are. I, I just you know don't think there are any of those either. I don't think they yeah. sold any of these with Windows 10 S. They probably haven't sold many of these. I agree with you. But yeah. I think a lot of times we, um, and I'm going to take myself out, most of us who are <laughs> in the tech press um, uh -huh. aren't normal users. And so we don't think like that. Like we're just like, of course you would upgrade to the better operating system, right? Of course you would. Why wouldn't you, right? Uh -huh. I'll tell you, every <laughs> single PC I have ever bought ever, mm -hmm. I have yep. never upgraded the operating system. I know oh, how. I, by the way, Shocking. I, that, Shocking. I could. No, no, hold on a second. <laughs> I, I, what kind of user are you? For a no, normal that's the human normal being. Windows way. Isn't it is. It? Oh, she's right. She's yes. no. By the way, you're right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> I, for a normal human being, and I this, and I don't mean some subset of humanity. I mean for most people, <laughs> most people. Period. All right. Um, upgrading an operating system. Well, I'm sorry. Upgrading Windows is about as normal of a thing to do as jumping out of an airplane. It just doesn't it feel right. I think it makes no. most people nervous. They would rather not do it. Right. I completely agree with that. Um, that said. Windows 10, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Surface Laptop in particular, um, has not emerged as the mainstream runaway bestseller that I thought it was going to be. In fact, curiously, this year it's been outsold by the new Surface Pro by, of, I think at the fact it was 3 to 1 or 4 to 1 or whatever the figure mm. is. But um, it has not emerged as this big success thing like I thought it was going to be. I really, really, really thought mm. this was going to be a mainstream success for Microsoft. Microsoft remains a boutique mm. PC maker. The types of people that go into a Microsoft store and buy a Surface Laptop or would go to Microsoft.com or whatever and buy a Surface laptop are not normal people. <laughs> they're they're they are people like me. They're people who are Microsoft fans. They're people who uh, are seeking this thing out. And they know exactly what they're getting. So I, I agree with you. I, I I just think all of these in that most people don't do that upgrade uh, normally. But yeah. I don't think that the audience for that or the audience for these third party devices that were running us mm -hmm. out of the box is a meaningful size to matter so that these yeah. statistics are just meaningless. I agree. Um, I agree on that. But but they also, I got to say, the stats did not surprise me. Like I saw other people going, that's totally impossible. Nope, that's a lie. And I'm like, You no, would have heard me say, what? <laughs> At the top of my life. Like when I saw that, I was like, there is no. You know what's but interesting I, to me is, is the complete uh, opposite of Mac users and Windows users. Because Mac mm -hmm. users routinely... And an yeah, almost uniformly upgrade every year their that's operating right. system. And Windows users buy a new computer I, when it's time to upgrade. Yeah, I can explain yeah. this. But 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 wait, um, before I before, before that, yep. I I think in the new world, especially in this last version of Windows world, Microsoft yep. wants its users oh, to yes. do what Apple users do yeah. for security yeah. reasons and, and other reasons, right? Mm -hmm. They have so all kinds of great reasons. They've got yeah. to train their users to get yeah. more like Apple users. That's right. No, you're right. And and the reason um, that Windows users historically have not upgraded to new versions of Windows when they came out is the same reason that Mac users have, which is that we all are the sum of our experiences. 
mm-hmm. if you have a consistently bad experience doing anything, you will stop doing that thing. And if you have a consistently good experience doing something, you, you will just keep doing it. And um, in, Microsoft has made great strides with upgrades. And now in this Windows as a service world, even though I think that it, the system is broken, I, I will at least give them credit to say, actually, mm-hmm. upgrading from one version of Windows 10 to another is not typically an earth-shattering experience for most people. It's, it's, mm-hmm. The success rate is actually really high. The mm-hmm. problem is most normal people don't know that. So it's like I've I've touched the hot stove a number of times. <laughs> I'm done touching the stove. I've heard you tell me that the stove is now <laughs> fixed and it will not burn me when I touch it. But I'm, I have been burned and I, I'm just going to – I'm going to go with what's been working for me. <laughs> I'm not going to touch it. And you I know, think that's also – That's how I sort of that- do that. There's also no reason to upgrade. Like it, like when people see me running Windows 10 Home, they're like, wow, why are you running Home? I'm like, well, why do I need yeah. to run Pro? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. I mean, you know, the simpler mobile systems like Android and iOS, um, those things, people don't even, I don't think people even worry a, about that. I, 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 though I would call that a cross grade. And this is something that can't happen in the Mac world because there aren't multiple SKUs of Mac OS. Mm. But that's yeah. a cross grade. When I say upgrade, mm. I'm thinking to the next uh, version to the next of version. what you have. Oh, well, I you mean, mean twice like from a year. seven to ten. Yes. Yeah. Well, but Microsoft is, uh, you know, they, they, they're kind of gaming the system here, right? So uh, Windows 10 version 1703, and then you go to Windows 10 version 1709. That That is that thing. It, it's, it is. They could have called yeah. it Windows 11, Windows 12, Windows 13. Those are all new versions of Windows. They call them feature mm-hmm. updates, but um, that is, in fact, you're, you're, you're installing a new version of the operating system. Mm. And... Um, I, I, by the way, the thing that Leo said earlier about Microsoft wanting to get that system is not only correct, but that's yeah. why these things are branded this way. Yeah. Yeah. They don't mm-hmm. want you to know that you're doing yeah. what right. you're doing. It's not a Windows yeah. upgrade. You're just patching yeah. it. Right. Yeah, you, if I, if you were telling features, me, you know. yeah, if you told me yeah. oh, you got to upgrade from 11 to 12, I'd be like, no, nah, I don't need to, yep. right? Would freak but, out. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's that's like, right. oh, that's no, exactly why they do it. Spring Creators update. Oh, okay. Why not? It's just I, a I don't, I'm update. not being cynical about this either. Um, <laughs> no, I know. I know. As Leo mentioned, there are very good reasons for those upgrades. It's, Nowadays, you know, yeah. it's a it's a feature upgrade, but you know, yeah. every one of these feature upgrades comes with major security advances and so forth. I mean, there's really Patches. good reasons yeah. to do it. No, it's true. Um, it's true. And you can make the argument if the process is it's not it's never going to be foolproof, but yeah. you know, compared to how it used to be, it's it's night and day. It's not even comparable. Yeah. Um, yeah. y- your risk is very low. Yep. Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. Agree. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it was a great treasure trove of info that these guys like just dumped on us on a Saturday. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> no, so let's talk about how much Windows really costs. I find this to be fascinating. All right. I'll just give you some rough numbers. This is kind of interesting to me. This is yeah, so. Uh, these are numbers of how much it costs to OEMs. Some to some OEMs, subset. Yeah. Of the always OEMs. wanted to know yeah. this, right? It was always yeah. assumed, you know, fifty bucks or whatever. But right, um, uh, it, it varies by market, right? And so if uh, let me let me go to home. I think the home one is probably the most uh, well, not the most interesting. Most of, it's the simplest because actually <laughs> uh, licensing gets really complicated in the commercial side because you could add in things like downgrade rights. Um, so right. for example. Any given SKU of Windows 10 Pro or whatever, uh, Windows 10 Enterprise maybe, um, you could just license that thing for a certain kind of computer at a certain cost. But if you want to license it and have downgrade rights, and probably to install with this equivalent Windows 7 version, you actually mm-hmm. pay extra for that. Um, I think a that's lot. smart. And they've probably always done that. Yeah. But it's, <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, they have. So Windows 10 Home runs from $25 to $101, depending on the capabilities of the computer. And so the very cheapest version, uh, which is, again, a a computer with an Atom, Celeron, or Pentium processor, 4 gigs of RAM or less, 32 gigs of storage or less, and then small screen sizes, I think it's 7, 9, I don't remember the exact screen sizes, that's $25. And the interesting thing there is that if you get, you can get that in, in, um, sorry, in S mode or not in S mode for the same price, there's no additional cost for not being in S mode. Uh, And that... I think it's tied to the fact that you as a as the end user can upgrade from S mode to non S mode for no cost. And then the you know kind of tears up from there. And so that remember where I was talking about the advanced either SKU or, or mode or whatever it might be, which is a core i9 processor, six core uh, core i7 and so forth, um, will cost um, up to $101, depending on the exact class of the computer and what the capabilities are. And then um, on the 
commercial and education markets, where the, which are the same. Essentially, education is commercial from a apparently from a licensing perspective. Um, it ranges from <laughs> crazily from ten dollars uh, for small tablets and entry level PCs uh, with Atom Celeron processors, etc., to about one hundred and seventeen uh, wow. for a mid range. I'm core amazed computer. that it gets up above a hundred, frankly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you could pay, by the way, for Windows 10 Pro in workstation mode or, in work, or Windows 10 Pro workstation, you could pay up to $244. Whoa. Now, you yeah. is the OEM. Mm -hmm. So it means a customer, typically an OEM cost, you double at least for the customer cost. Well, right? think well, about the computer that they're bought. Right. See, you don't really, I don't know how you would think of this, but you got to think of a As workstation a percentage class. percentage of the computer. overall cost of the computer, I understand that that's reasonable. We could be talking about an 8, 12 core, yeah. whatever, something, dual mm -hmm. processor, dual graphics cards. It's it's designed for engineering tasks, whatever it is. This computer could cost five, ten thousand dollars. It could be any any price. So two hundred forty four dollars. It's like whatever. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. No, no. Mm -hmm. It's or five hundred eighty eight dollars for the consumer. Yeah, right. yeah. And it's also up to the OEM how much they want to pass on to the right. consumer. Right. Right. And, yes, that's and for so, sure. But we always hear like so, if it's a ten cent part. Oh no, mm -hmm. the ten cent part. That's going to really raise the cost of the computer mm -hmm. because of Markup or yeah. whatever OEM. Yeah. Right. Well, but, you know, it, it, okay. But with sure. Windows 10 Pro for workstations, for example, I wrote this piece um, late last year because my, Microsoft had told OEMs they were going to jack the price way up when they came out with Windows wow. 10 Pro for workstations. So <laughs> Did they some use that OEMs, exact phrase? Yeah, we're going to just <laughs> a little uh, heads up here. The, the slide actually said gonna, jack the price jack up. Price <laughs> well, that, but so then here's what the OEMs did, which was interesting. The OEMs started telling their customers, right? So they started telling right. enterprises, hey, Microsoft's doing this. And then customers were forwarding me these emails, right? And they were like, hey, did you know Microsoft's going to do this? And like, we're going to get caught in the middle here. So I wrote about it um, last fall. And I'm like, hey, Microsoft's about to increase the price of this to OEMs. And they're going to pass it on to you, Right, the because there's not a lot of margin <laughs> in a modern PC. I mean, they've got right. to. Right. Well, by the way, so uh, I don't want, you know, tiered pricing, uh, this part of me, I think, uh, you know, I, you almost wish for a flat tax in some ways just well, to make it simple. Well, like whatever. a percent of the purchase yeah. prices. Are, but, you yeah. know, this is where Apple has a huge advantage because they're a oh, hardware yeah. manufacturer. Yep. They don't have to have multiple SKUs. I mean, this explains why there's multiple SKUs, right? It does. That's right. Windows. Of course. It and and it, yep. the, the thing I hope for, and I, I, again, there's no precedent for this, but I do hope for it, is that um, I don't mind the cost being pushed along to the consumer. That makes sense. You're buying a higher end PC. It's going to be more money, whatever. You you, you probably never would even the Microsoft know tax. or have any. Consumers the know about the Microsoft tax. But um, I, I hope that the complexity of this is not passed along to the computer because part of Microsoft's strategy yeah. this year, part of this transition is they've really kind of divided the market into these different categories. And so it's 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 a little more complicated than low end, medium, mm. high end, and whatever. It, there's like eight or nine of these. You know what Chris Capicello would say here? We didn't <laughs> mean to tell anybody, Paul. You told everybody. Exactly. It's a secret. <laughs> well, no, no, no. What I'm asking, well, I guess, what I'm wondering is, I, would, I, I hope people wouldn't even this... know if it weren't for you, Paul. <laughs> Okay. I, I see how this conversation has changed and how I am. No, no, we're very grateful. I'm and saying how the what hunter has become the hunter. Uh, Shoot the messenger. Exactly. No, but I, I, I understand that the numbers that I'm citing are aimed at, uh, you know, OEMs, PC makers, yeah. right? I get that. Um, They're not for consumers. What I don't to like to see is, yeah, the complexity of this passed on to the consumer. In other words, yeah. I don't I don't care that the price is. It, it's fair. It seems to me, you know, or... Mm. It, it doesn't matter if one hundred five dollars, whatever the price is, is you know fair. I mean, it's fair that as the price goes up, those prices get passed along to the buy the buyer of that computer, right? But you know, the the issue with Windows has always been well, <laughs> the issue that one of the million issues with Windows has always been that the price of Windows is a huge percentage of the price of any given computer, right? Mm -hmm. And as things like uh, netbooks back in the day that were running Linux have come into the market, or today would be Chromebooks, um, they don't tend to line up very well price wise yeah. that's been the, right. that's a problem right there are other problems you know complexity and so forth but but let's look looking just at the price if you say like this computer over here is $179 and this computer over here is $279 and the one that's more expensive is running windows part of the reason that thing is more expensive is because it's running windows <laughs> you know and they're paying for that and so yeah. there, there's 
it looks like, and again, I don't know what to compare this to. I don't have figures like this for, you know, every version of Windows or every year going back in history. But it seems like lower end versions are a lot less expensive and will will help make this equation make some more sense. Um, yeah. You know, the idea is uh, we're going to be able to do this very soon. Uh, and this is just education market. But the Lenovo education PCs that were announced at BET are going to be available as Chromebooks, too. Oh, right. wow. And so we're going to be able to make a comparison there, um, not just in how those things perform and work, but in, in how they're priced as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I guess what I'm saying, I'm sorry, I, this is a, I kind of work, walked around this, but I, I hope that no consumer ever has to deal with the complexity of this pricing structure. That yeah. this, what's not changing is that you're just buying a computer and you don't have to worry about this stuff. You know what the complexity yeah. they're going to have to deal with, though, is... There, and this, so Microsoft, it seems to me, doing this uh, to make the OEMs happy. So the OEMs have a broader range of price points, so they can offer a 10s, in effect, a 10s computer. Microsoft yeah. will take the extra 50 bucks and make it mm -hmm. a pro computer. But from the right. OEMs' point of view, oh no, we made, now it's a cheaper PC that looks good in our ad. The problem is, it is for the consumer more complex. Not, and it's not about price. It's about well, what what am I, what Windows am I getting? Right, which version is on there? Yeah. And, and oh, by the way, which, the which Windows capabilities am I getting, well, too? Precisely. Because that's yeah. another part of this. And didn't, there, it's it seems not just, to me, a few years ago, Microsoft said, we have too many SKUs. We're going to simplify yeah. Windows. And now well, they're going I, back, listen, right? Microsoft is a sign curve. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> everything they do comes back again. Like, it's they yeah. kind of go back and forth. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> You know what they'll can, say? You know, you know what they'll say? Remember when they introduced Windows 10, they said, there's only two SKUs. There's Home and Pro. That's right. what they said, sure. right. even though they, they were lied. actually like 10. <laughs> yeah. They don't want customers to No, they were just to trying to it. simplify yeah. it, right? They're like, yeah. all you have to but know is there's Home and OEMs Pro. OEMs can handle it. They don't want, cause it, but, but, but customers shouldn't have to. We need to see but what now this looks like in the real world. Now customers are going to be confused because they're going to get a, a computer yeah, right. that doesn't run Chrome. And they're going to say, so, "Well, wait a minute." And then, it's, well, well, it's, that's even, it's 50 worse bucks than that. Um, wait a minute. That's just that's just S mode. I mean, if it, there's there's another whole set of capabilities that go beyond that. There are these uh, kind of hero capabilities that are built into Windows 10 that's the that typically Microsoft today have using is hero PC. Yeah. What, what, mm -hmm. Tell me about well, that. Well, in other words, well, for example, Windows Hello, right? So, if you want to get a laptop that has a Windows Hello <laughs> IR camera, it historically. That thing has been a high-end computer because okay. that component has been yeah, kind of expensive. The, Hello's the hero. Um, there's a bunch of other things yeah. like uh, the, they Inking. list Cortana. Hmm? Yeah. Sorry. Inking too. Inking. Inking. Yeah. Inking. Yeah. Um, uh, Near-field communication capabilities for Cortana. You know the notion that your computer could be sitting yeah. over at the other side of the room and you could say something and you could be playing music, it would still work. Whatever. Oh boy, those things um, show this, up in the ads, and then yeah. people get the computer home. Yeah. That's the kind of complexity consumers. There's a, some serious complexity consumers. there. And the, yeah. the problem is when you look at that range of computers, like I said, it's not low end, mid range, high end. There's like nine of them. Um, those features kind of filter down into the different things. Mm -hmm. So even within pro or home or whatever, um, you could buy like what they call like a value computer, which is not quite the lowest end computer, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to get that stuff, you know? And so mm -hmm. you paid less for the version of Windows <laughs> that came on that computer. You don't really know that, but you did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not that it's not built into the code. It's in there. It's just that you don't have the capability to take advantage of it. Even I get right. burnt by this. We spent a long time, I talked about this last week, fumfering on the radio show because I didn't understand that home didn't have the ability to defer updates and pro yep. did, and I didn't know which of my machines were home and which were pro. Mm -hmm. And I so sure. I had differing abilities, and I was massively confused by that. And yeah. that this is going to be multiplied now. So well, I, 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 yeah. I know they've also talked to OEMs <laughs> in the past about putting logos representing these different hero capabilities on boxes, right? So if mm -hmm. something has Cortana, it'll have the Cortana symbol. If it has hello, it'll have the little smiley face. So that could help make it a little less complex for somebody who's in the market for a new PC. You know, that they're like, okay, this one has a little smiley face. This one doesn't have a little smiley face. I could just I, tell I, you, as somebody who talks to customers I, yeah. all the time on the radio show, which is the low end yeah. show, right? this is baffling. It's confusing. People. It's not what they want <laughs> yeah. and it'll drive so, them to a Mac because Apple doesn't right. have differing capabilities. That's right. It By the way, this you could um, extrapolate this to the entire Microsoft stack. I'm writing an article now about uh, Office 365 versus G Suite. And one of the things I keep coming back to is, of course, Microsoft stuff is more powerful. Of course it is. 
Of course, it's also more complex. Of course, it's really popular with big, slow-moving businesses that are never going to innovate anything. Um, the problem, for, and, and by the way, it's from a revenue perspective, it's approximately 10 size the size of G Suite right now. And so you could look at this situation and say, obviously, they're winning. And the answer is, yeah, they are. But the problem is, it's not simple and it's not super inexpensive. Yeah. And I think that drives people away. Well, that's, and mm. I think that's what happens ultimately. It starts in education in that case. Yeah. But um, yeah, you know, I, you just want to buy a computer and it, <laughs> you, know, you just want it to work. I mean, we've, worked, I, I think we've we kind accept. of worked backwards to, the, to Apple's business model. We'll decide yeah. everything because yeah. choice is com equals complexity. Mm. And we'll tell you yes. how it's supposed to work. And, right. There and, are too many bottles of dressing in the supermarket, yeah. and yeah. I'm just going to go to the place that and has I one. I think real people yeah. don't want that yeah. much choice. Uh, I know when they ask me a question, they don't want me to say, well, there's three different yeah. ways you could do this. They want me to tell yeah. them the way to do it. Well, that's And that's what I meant earlier when I said, you know, I'm worried that this complexity is going to make its way down to the con to the mm -hmm. consumer. I, In that I, sense, it will, and it's worse. It than, is, it's not about price because I don't know how I don't know how you communicate this. Yeah, you. Can. Yeah, I don't know how you communicate this. Um, well, one way they could do it, just thinking aloud, is you know, um, if you go to the Microsoft Store website right now, you know, they have that "Help me choose the PC" thing. Have you seen that? Like little, sure. yeah, whatever that is. You shouldn't so have, if you to say, have like, a decision tree. To choose your computer. <laughs> we, yeah. What we offer is really complex. We could help. I know. So, you know, <laughs> you know yeah, I mean, um, I mean, it is, it's not simple. I mean, I remember when I was in the market for my PC not that long ago, I was like, I can't decide. There's too many choices and I can't figure out what I need. And, yeah, and you're you know, a sophisticated that, user. I know. Um, so you know, so I like having choice. I, I agree that it's fun to have choice and it's great to have choice and it does make things more complex. I guess the only thing that's kind of saving Microsoft here is Apple is still more expensive. Um, so that yeah. may keep people in the And by the way, Apple the seems to have ignored their Mac product line largely yeah. for quite a while, right. <laughs> you know, especially right. for consumers. No, there's an opportunity um, that's, for Microsoft, that's but, but that's the point. Is, are no, but the, you, you actually can't fix this. I mean, think about it. In, in the smartphone world, there are, there are tiers of devices. Of course there are. There mm -hmm. are high-end processors, low-end processors, more RAM, less RAM, more storage, whatever. Yeah. But that's, that's simple comparatively, right? Yeah, people understand you know, that. They get that. Yeah. That, as but if you tell them, well, that Vista. camera can do hello, but that camera can't, good luck right. explaining that. Oh, uh, and then add the But I other saw items, the right? ad that said yeah. you just look at your computer and it recognizes right. you. Yeah. Right. Wait a minute. This doesn't. Remember, so it used to be. Remember, Microsoft used to have, um, um, I forget what they call it. There was It was a number that measured the performance of your computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, yeah. and I think the point of that oh, yeah. was they were kind of hoping. I got a 6.5. Yeah, yeah, you could put this number on a box and yeah. someone would walk up and understood what it meant. And they got rid of it really quickly because yeah. they understood this thing was not scalable. But mm -hmm. it started with Vista. This was the beginning of um, uh, my computer can or cannot run Aero Glass was the first step toward this horrible future we're now living in, you know. And yeah. and the computer, it, by just by nature of the complexity and uh, sheer range of capabilities of the device, there's there's all these different things you can do with it, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, um, and they're starting to tier the... It may the product and the pricing to match. Now, enthusiasts are the exact opposite. They want choice and they can understand yeah. choice. In fact, they revel in it. They, rev, yeah. you know, they go, they're the ones who, you know, yep. say, well, you need a Z axis on your camera. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> you yep. know, is that DDR3 RAM? Come on. <laughs> really? You're still on three? <laughs> so yeah. they they revel in that, and maybe that's Microsoft just saying, "Look, that's the that's the that's the market for us. That's where we want to well, be businesses." I, and I don't think it is. No, it's not the market for them. That's that's the no. problem. <laughs> well, it's a market, but it's not the big part of the market. Yeah. It's certainly the high margin part of the market. Yeah. Yes, but but again, you know, the I, <laughs> I think the point. It's funny because the the point of this plan literally is to take what 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 made that part of the market successful. And apply it to these other markets. You know, they need to drive volume, not just a subset of the market, which is not the volume part of the market. Um, of course, it's hard to take something that's high margin and apply that success to something that's not. And I think that's why we see this tiered pricing model. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I wish I knew. You know, maybe someone could show me a chart where they would say, Paul, you know, when Windows 7 came out, the chart for the pricing was exactly the same. You're complaining about nothing. But it seems like this has gotten very complex to me. I think on the OEM side, it's always been like this. I don't yeah. think this, like sure. the tiering is yeah. new. But OEMs can um, handle it. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think they like having more options, right? Well, yeah, because look at they, Lenovo. Mm -hmm. If you go to Lenovo right. and buy, you got the X, you got the T, 
you right. get the, they could zero in more and like the exact right market that they yeah, want to target the way, or something. That's right? another kind of complexity that I disagree with. Um, I think there are too many of these things. It's just like I use yeah. BMW because I happen to know the car, the car lines very well. But um, BMW used to be very simple. It was three fuck series, this? five yeah. series, and seven series, and that was pretty much it. There was you know yeah. they would do a six occasionally or whatever, but mm -hmm. that was the car line. And now they, you could I couldn't explain it if we had two hours. I, the <laughs> the shared number of models and and weird differences and. Uh, yeah. Different kinds of M class cars they have. Some of them are not real M's, and some of them are real. I mean, it's ludicrous, and that's mm. what PC makers have done. That's what Microsoft is doing to match. I mean, the whole thing is—it's an explosion of choice. And yeah, it just I mean, creates people, confusion. people say I want an all-in-one from HP, and I say, well, yeah, there's definitely a difference between the HP Pavilion all-in-one and the HP Envy all-in-one. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, but they look the same. No, no. <laughs> oh, there's also yeah. just an HP non. Anything all in one. Mm -hmm. sure. I don't even know oh, what and that by the way, is. you haven't you haven't even broached the commercial side. You might want one of the business class oh, devices that's because true. did you know <laughs> you can pull the screen off and replace it with a different and screen? Part of it is I have a little bit of a vested interest in this because I have to talk about this stuff on the radio. <laughs> it's confusing. Yeah, it's a wonder we're not all insane people, by the way. I know. <laughs> we're you know, yeah. if you talk to enthusiasts, it's fine. It's easy. Because yeah. you just you know, but you talk to re regular people, they just uh, yep. It's hard for them, and yep. I, and I yeah. sympathize. Let, can we just take a little break because we have a we're we're getting behind <laughs> on the uh, I most know, important I know. part of this show, yeah. which is sorry. This is ads. a big. It's just such a big topic. No, you got a hell of a scoop, and uh, and I, I think it's fascinating, frankly, and it's a little peek behind the kimono. Well, I, to be fair, uh, Brad Brad is the one who um, originally obtained this information. Yeah, I, I, I just want to let you know I got credits it. to the little <laughs> fireman where it's still there. <laughs> You're taking all the credit, but really, I, I'm the one who found the documents. Yeah, well, he he would be the, the first to let you know that. I was the I was it was a fire engine, and I uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just had to I, I I leapt into the flames, and I pulled out the fire document. <laughs> the documents out. Uh, <laughs> People listening to audio have no idea. No, what <laughs> I, think, I think they're getting the gist of it. Maybe it's, they are. Yeah, Brad doesn't talk like that. I'm sorry, Brad. Our show, <laughs> our show today brought to you by It Pro TV, the fun, engaging entertainment way to get a job in IT. You know, get the certs that you need to get the job, or to keep your job in IT and get a better one, get better pay polish your skills. One of the reasons I think we like IT as a profession is because you're always learning. You're always growing, right? I mean, that's part of the fun of it. It's not like you've mastered it. You never get to the point where you go, oh, yeah, I got this. There's always something new. And that's fun. Plus, there's always new opportunities, new job opportunities. Because, Well, for instance, one million unfilled positions in 2017, one million for computer security professionals. I talked to a, a guy yesterday. This was actually great. Uh, he said, yeah, I've been listening to you for five years. I started listening in college. Uh, I listen to security now. I listen to Windows Weekly. Uh, I, I, I was bored with computer science. I listened to you. I got into uh, IT security, got job offers from the CIA and the FBI, turned them down because government jobs were about one-third what the commercial sector was. It was actually good. Lisa said, well, that's fine. You know, work in the commercial sector, but then you can give back when, you know, and, and when you're close to retirement, you can give back and go work to for the private, the public sector, give back a little bit. He said, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Great guy. Loves his job. Loves what he's doing and is always learning. That's the point of IT Pro TV. Sharpen your IT skills. And if you run an IT team, empower your team with IT Pro TV. So the way they do it is kind of like us. In fact, they were inspired by Twit. They have a television, basically internet television station. But unlike us, they have five studios. <laughs> they do 125 hours of content live every week. They're on the East Coast. So it's Monday through Friday, Eastern, 9 to 5. And you can watch it. They have a chat room just like us. You can chat with the hosts. It's very engaging, very fun. And then, of course, everything live goes on demand. So you can. there's more than 3,300 hours now of binge-worthy content there. In every aspect, they make it very easy to watch. Of course, they have. Uh, you can do it on your PC, but they have a Chromecast uh, app. They have an Android app. They have an iOS app. They've got a Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV app so it's very and the great apps too so it's very easy to watch 
watching your big screen when you're having breakfast, get in the car, listen on your Android device as you're driving to work, have it running in the background as you're working on your PC. And by osmosis, you're just going to absorb all this content. The courses they're working on right now, version 9 of the uh, Certified Ethical Hacker cert. That's so much fun. It's just a great one to have. Yeah, I'm a certified ethical hacker. What about it? Uh, by the way, that's what this guy was yesterday. He was a white hat. He created offensive exploits for, well, I won't say who. Uh, CISA, SQL Server. <laughs> I guess I have to re re respect some confidences. SQL Server 2016. Uh, this week they're doing Azure 7533. I don't, I don't, maybe Mary Jo knows what that means. I don't know what that means. CC, <laughs> what is 7533? Is that a I don't version? know. I was like, what is that? <laughs> yeah, must have to do with the cert. I don't know. CCNA Security. Uh, if you just want to be, you know, basic fix-it guy, that A-plus cert really helps you get a job in IT, in service. CompTIA is A-plus. They're doing all of that this week, and they have all the other certs, too. If you get the team portal, you can track your team's results and really prove the ROI to the boss on your, on your training spend because they have this IT Pro Super, uh, TV supervisor portal. Complete control over your team's training schedule. You can create custom groups and training assignments. View logins, viewing time, video downloads, course completion tracking. You can see how any individual is doing, how the group is doing as a whole. The team solution has group pricing to it and is great. Uh, we met a guy named uh, James Packer. He's a IT Pro TV member. He, uh, he used it for not only training himself, but for his team. And now I'm... I'm He's got recruited to a job, this is his quote, in a literal tropical paradise. The world needs IT professionals. They're waiting for you. If you want to know more about IT Pro TV for individuals or teams, in fact, you can get a free team trial, at the, and including their supervisor portal. Right now, everybody, go to itpro.tv slash www for Windows Weekly. itpro.tv slash www. You can also sign up for an individual monthly membership and a free seven-day trial. But you got to use the code dubdub30. So it's so one more time, itpro.tv slash www, and the offer code is ww30 for 30% off your subscription for the lifetime of your active subscription. They've upped the numbers. It's now 90,000 IT Pro TV members. And I take I think I take credit for a few of those. Premium subscriptions include unlimited transcender practice exams and virtual labs. Normally $857 a year with this offer code, $600. That's 50 bucks a month for this unbelievable training. The practice exams alone are 100 bucks. ITPro.tv slash WW. Don't forget that code, WW30. Flexible training, binge-worthy content, proven ROI. It's ITPro TV. ITPro.tv slash WW, and that code is WW30. Back to Windows Weekly we go, and I am actually really... Are you done with your scoop, Paul? I mean... Yeah, I think we, that's have pretty we much most of it, talked isn't about it? everything you know? Yeah, All I right. think so. Let's move on then to um, the very, to me, very exciting shift from UWP to PWA. <laughs> it's kind of an alphabetic miracle. Sure. <laughs> no, actually, I am excited about this. Yeah. Progressive web apps for Windows 10 are really finally happening. I know. So Paul told us this. Remember, we, he, he had the guys talk to him all about this. So it's really happening. Exactly what they told him is happening. So um, what, what is happening? Windows 10 Redstone 4 coming out this spring is going to have um, all the pieces in place for the foundation for Microsoft to be able to support progressive web apps. This is so exciting for developers. I know. I think. Yeah. So here's what we didn't know, or I didn't know this anyway. They, they've been out there for the past year crawling the web using Bing Crawler, and they're identifying PWAs that might be good, they think, for really? Windows 10. Interesting. Yep. And they've looked at 1.5 million potential candidates and they've created a small subset that they are going to put in the Windows store. So they are going to proactively go and put these in the store. So there will be some in the store already. And they're telling developers now you can get ready to sub submit your own progressive web apps. Also, we've got this tool called the PWA Builder Tool I think it used to be called Manifold JS. I think that's the same thing um, that will let you 
um, package up your progressive web app like an Apex and also get that into the store. So it's really going to happen. It's not just like, oh, the support will be there. And then, you know, 10 more months, you'll start seeing them come in. No, I think they're going to be in there like from the get go. There's going to be some. So here they come. Progressive so web excited. apps in the Windows Store. This to me um, reminds me of the move to Ajax using Ajax on websites mm -hmm. where suddenly everybody was doing it. Um, yep. We had a well, guy in the other day who uh, teaches Angular. Yeah, in fact, he has a right. boot camp for Angular, Angular, which is a JavaScript framework, which is one of many that can be yeah. used to make PWAs. And I'm kind of yep. really thinking, if I were, I might just do it for fun, but if I were a younger guy, yep. man, I would learn this. This would right be, now. you this want to focus on JavaScript and you want yep. to learn this stuff. HTML5, yeah. JavaScript. So this is the biggest thing that's ever happened, I think, in apps, period. And the reason is this stuff will be literally universal, right? Um, Apple revealed, uh, they never kind of announced it, but in the release notes, I think for the 11.3 developer preview, uh, Safari will support uh, PWA technology in the next version of their platform as well. So yeah, this is something news. you're going to be able, great. these apps are going to target iOS, Mac, mm -hmm. Android, Chrome, and Windows 10. You develop one app, it's basically a web app. Yep. But because of service workers on the various platforms, it downloads and mm -hmm. turns into an app, and it's completely cross-platform. Right. Amazing. It could have, you know, they're, they're kind of described as native-ish, but and I, that probably brings up bad memories of Java. I, mm -hmm. I do sort of think that PWA is, you know, 20 years later, Java done right. It's the Java as mm -hmm. we kind of hoped Java would be. Uh, but, yeah, it, it's... And it's not Electron, which is a kind of... Right. A, a bad right. word these days because so Electron Adobe is Air. so heavy. <laughs> well, right. Adobe Air, but Electron kind of brings Google Chrome basically onto every into yeah. every no, app. No, no. This is no. not yeah. heavyweight like that. No, but, this is no. this is big. I would say I'm sorry uh, on Windows 10 in particular, and for Microsoft in particular, this is huge because uh, the UWP platform, the Windows Store, the Microsoft Store as we now call it, uh, has not been successful and. Uh, Microsoft has done everything they can to get developers to bring their code bases to Windows 10. They've released all those bridges, technologies, and so forth. But um, the native app platform just isn't happening. And when you look at, you know, if you're a developer, you, obviously you're pragmatic. You look at the available platforms. Where are you going to put your stuff? Um, you know, the web is the biggest platform by far. Mobile is humongous, but not just humongous, but also actively engaged with looking for apps and installing apps and using apps and so forth. And then there's kind of Windows, you know, and, and Windows... 10, you know, despite all this this kind of push to these modern uh, mobile app platform stuff, we're still very much focused on the desktop apps from the past. You know, we still just, we, we, mm -hmm. we used Photoshop and Office and iTunes and, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And this is going to really bring modern web app technology to Windows in an elegant way for the first time, in a first class way. Uh, it's going to make it discoverable uh, the way that you want it to be discoverable. You can go into the Windows Store if that's how you want to do it and get it that way. Um, eventually they're talking about uh, doing the install directly from a Bing search result. You know, you can, um, you can just install from the browser, you know? Yeah. So it this was, is just, it, this their is blog post, their blog post this week was kind of funny because they have a whole section where, you know, it's not either or UWP or PWA. <laughs> and yeah. then they, you go to read that section <laughs> And they don't mm -hmm. make a convincing case for UWP. They they basically you. say, you know, if you're a new <laughs> if you're a new a new developer, you probably are thinking about UWP. And you know, like I mean, you're not thinking about UWP. You're thinking about PWA. And if you're somebody who's a cross platform developer, you're probably thinking about PWA. And you know, there are some people who still might think they want to do a native app, but yeah, you can. U UWP <laughs> is the Microsoft Store apps, basically, right? Yeah. right. Universal Windows platform, okay. right? So and that, um, that is not a cross-platform solution. No, no. Yeah. Despite the a, word well, universal it's in its title. It's a cross-Windows yeah. 10 yeah, right. platform, yeah. right? It, look, uh, there is no version of the story where we can't say window, that UWP has not failed. It has completely failed. It, it yeah. is just not met the bar. Um, and... This is going to save the platform in many ways. It's weird, but by opening up Windows to this uni truly universal app platform, we're finally going to get first-class apps in the Windows Store. Not that there aren't some in there today. No, I, I realize there there's certainly a handful, right. but um, it, I mean, there's even no Microsoft's way that Windows is ever going to. Teams. Oh, right. well, Teams is the quintessential example. My, the, one of the most important apps for Microsoft going forward, the Teams client, mm -hmm. um, they're building that as a PWA. 
It's not even so, in the store yet. <laughs> I'll give you another one of my little ivory tower dreams of the future is, you know, there, there's been a lot of complaining lately about various aspects of uh, Microsoft's apps strategy. You know, what's going on with Office, right? What we're still mm -hmm. we're still building something called Office 2019. Um, Microsoft has pushed web versions of the Office apps. They've pushed mm -hmm. mobile versions of the Office apps, right? Yep. And now they're putting the normal versions of the Office apps in the store. It's like, what are they? What are they doing with this thing? Like, <laughs> what, they can't even they can't use their own app platform to make good versions of their apps. Um, it makes me wonder if this isn't a signal that the reason we're kind of treading water here is because they are working for, to that future. They've sort of gotten this religion and understood that this is where these things are mm -hmm. going. And I think the success of Teams is going to help drive that. Um, it mm -hmm. gives them something they can show, not just the folks at Office, obviously, but all around Microsoft. Like, hey, you should be doing this thing. Um, so I can dream. <laughs> but um, I sort of, no, I, I not sort of, but I really do hope that they take this very seriously because mm -hmm. they have lost an incredible amount of time working on these dopey things that have never gone anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I, this is their chance to do the one thing that could work well everywhere um, not just on their own platform but on linux uh, you know yeah, but that's, on that's the new Mac. microsoft right it's uh it's mm -hmm. everywhere instead of it fits know, right yeah. it, it's yeah. it's it makes sense you credit satya with that i think yeah um you know although <laughs> alex gumpel was just telling me that one of the reasons skype desktop is so god awful is it's electron based <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I would hope that maybe Microsoft okay. would look at that and say, oh, you know, maybe we should make this one a progressive web app as well. They should. <laughs> but is, are the Skype guys still really totally autonomous? I guess they are. That's why they're doing this. Well, I, you know, uh, Skype on the business end is turning into Teams anyway. Right. right. So it yeah. begs the question that is, a, that is is going to be a PWA. So right. right. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't the That's consumer That's how Microsoft client. leads the way. Is it, yeah. it, 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 it eats its own dog food and makes everything it can mm -hmm. a PWA. Could Plus you make Office them. a PWA? That's what they I'm told you, right? I'm arguing that they... Sh no, 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 no. What oh, they've I said is they we're talk they we, they've talked to those guys. I mean, uh, Outlook in particular is one. And I use this example all the time because there are like 17 different versions of Outlook. Mm -hmm. um, some of which are good, bad, or indifferent. Um, I think they've done some cool stuff on the web, which is convenient because I think that's the thing that should become Outlook. We, I think we talked about this a yeah. week ago or two, this notion that the, you know, the Windows 10 built-in apps are terrible. Um, this yeah, could change that really there dramatically. Yeah, that would be a good right? start. Yeah. Good place to start. It also would help them, right? And because like we said, they're, yeah. well, they're developing their platform. So when they come out with an app like Office, it's everywhere. Yeah. It's on, it's on Mac, it's on Android, it's everywhere. And so if you're Microsoft and you have this team building Office, you're like, you know what? We need to build this once instead of have to do it for every platform this and all, this, try to keep the way, it all sync. This will also help the people that have a hard time um, with this new Microsoft strategy. The people who want mm -hmm. the Windows first or Windows better kind of thing. To, yeah. Because yeah. one of the beautiful things about PWAs is that they can take on native capabilities that are specific to different platforms. So on Windows 10, it's possible for a PWA to expose native Windows 10 features that you wouldn't see when you run that app on Android or some other platform. They literally mm -hmm. could be better on Windows 10. Um, the other aspect of PWA that's very exciting, and I, I think we talked about this way back in October or November whenever I wrote that original article about PWAs, is that Microsoft has pledged to drop native OS features when PWA features catch up or surpass those features, that they wow. will not... Wow. Compete with stuff in good. PWA. They will simply adopt the thing when it's better. Do they? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just want to be clear. Mm -hmm. Electron is not considered PWA, or is it? From their point, of view? I don't believe it is. Only because because Teams is in Electron. I've just been looking. Um, so, but so Teams is, is transitioning to PWA. Visual so Studio yeah. is in a, is the code editor is. Well, in so Electron. by the way, <laughs> uh, this is later in the notes, but uh, Microsoft has not officially announced build, but build's coming. It's coming in May, and if PWA is not the centerpiece of this entire developer um, uh, focus that they have at the show, I'm going to be shocked. Yeah. Because I really, you know, you talk about a transition year. No. Nope. Um, what about this the takes complaints? On a bigger and I'm seeing this in the chat room. Mm -hmm. That there are that P 
people will end up back on native apps because of the huge limitations of this of this kind of development, PWA. Yes. Mm -hmm. So to the chicken littles of the world, I will say. <laughs> it's never going to work. <laughs> it's never yeah. going to work. It's weird how technology it's never, never improves. Work. Okay. Um, no, I, that's, that's ridiculous. I, the, the, these things don't, it's not a hard stop, right? This is the Windows 10S thing again. It doesn't just, we don't just switch to PWA today. There'll be we some native apps, right? We, Still? Yeah, we, there will there always will. be native apps. It doesn't yeah. mean things go away, but, but things will transition away and PWA gets more powerful. PWA gets more powerful on Windows 10 specifically. By the way, mm -hmm. that, again, I don't know what they're going to announce a build, but, you know, Windows 10 features exposed through PWA, right? It's like um, uh, when they make the transition from .NET to .NET Core, the first version doesn't do everything. Yeah. Uh, I think last week Mary Jo talked about, I think she talked about .NET 2.1. Yeah. One yeah. of the features of .NET 2.1 is a Windows-only library that brings back a ton of features from the .NET framework to .NET Core only on Windows because that's what developers need, right? Mm -hmm. These things, that's how life works. It happens mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. I, I, this is, PWA is inevitable. The only question is whether Microsoft can move quick enough to make it matter on Windows. That's the only question. It's, it is happening with or without Microsoft. I'm excited that they're taking these mm -hmm. steps. And if you're a developer yeah. today, you know, there's, the one thing that Microsoft developers will probably agree with, I hope they'll agree with, is that what, for whatever the changes that have occurred over the years, for whatever the technology side roads we've gone down and then stepped back from, for the for the .NET stuff and the stuff that built off of .NET, like uh, PD, uh, WPF or uh, actually the UWP stuff, which builds off of whatever it is, Microsoft always provides you with a path forward as well, right? Mm -hmm. So in addition to opening up Windows to these code bases from other platforms, they've always been very cognizant of this base of developers that they have. And that if you're a .NET developer or a Microsoft Stack developer today, they're going to provide you with the tools, technologies, SDKs, whatever it is, to take your skills forward into this new era. It's not, it's it. You know, you can take it. Go take a JavaScript course, please. But I mean, I, I they're going to provide a way for developers to be able to target PD, you know, PWA in a, in a sophisticated manner. Do uh, so at this point, you, uh, of course, the key to making PWA work is the service workers on each platform. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like uh, I didn't realize Apple had committed. I thought Apple was kind of on the fence on all of this, putting this. They were, oh, no, what I mean by that is they did not announce. They've not announced anything, right? Yeah. Of course, their developer show doesn't happen until June. And they or may end up but, doing something as typical with Apple that's uniquely Apple, as opposed to yeah. well. So yeah, we, no one knows. I mean, they, they, right. what they've met, what they've said is that Safari in both platforms is supporting this service technology, workers. including Good. service workers. So, but what we don't know is. Well, I should say what we do know is my, what the, the innovation that Microsoft has bought, brought to this so far is they looked at this thing and said, hey, this is cool. We're in. Let's put it. We're going to put it in the store. Yeah. That's a, that yeah, itself that's is amazing. Yeah. Google's mm -hmm. not doing that right now. But, but right. Yeah. Microsoft and Google talks to each other. These guys do anyway. Right. And the Google guys were like, we really want to know about how you're doing this. This looks interesting to us because yeah. the Android experience today is you bring up a PWA in Chrome browser and it pops up a little dialogue. Or you can bring down that little menu and it's, it will be in there as well. And that's how you kind of install it onto your phone typically, right? right. Um, that's pretty good. And that's and a lot of people might argue, I, I think it's 50-50, whatever, but that that might even be a better way to discover new apps and get them installed Heck yes. on your phone. Mm, yeah. But Google is looking at this and they're saying, okay, hold on a second. We like this store idea. And I think they're going to do that as well. Um, mm. And I mentioned that Microsoft has looked at the reverse and I mentioned that they will be that at least they're looking at it, they intend to put the ability to install a PWA from a web browser in Windows 10. Um, it, it just opens the whole thing up. So when you talk about Apple, you know, how's Apple going to do it? They have add to home screen for web pages. Will they do it that way? Will they add it to the store? You know, no one knows. Um, and we probably won't know until June. Mm. We'll see. And also, to be clear, this is not the same as the web apps that uh, the iPhone first came with. This right. is not uh, well, just, it, it might <laughs> honestly, superficially be a little like that. I was going to, uh, maybe even more than, I mean, obviously the technology has improved. I mean, I think it's interesting that um, you, you could make the argument that this is a, a legitimate successor to that and that some of the important capabilities that didn't exist then exist now, like offline and 
uh, local data and so forth. I mean, the point behind the web app platform at the time, I think, was to shield the phone from the abuses that could happen if you got too much access to the right. machine itself. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean... And, and, you know, Google is in in the sense that if you search for PWA, yeah. you'll get mm -hmm. pulled right to a Google developers page that has your mm -hmm. first, you know, PWA program. Here's how you do yeah. it. Uh, you know, they're serious about it. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, they, invent, they, that's, they came up. With that's it, key that there's broad support. Uh, mm -hmm. Chat room's telling me WebKit, even if Safari isn't in, WebKit is. So, yep. um, yeah, Mozilla has pledged support Mozilla for this as is, well. Chrome I mean, is, yeah, I, this is big. I, obviously, you kind of want it from your platform maker. Um, Chrome is interesting because it will be in Chrome OS, right? I, yeah. we, we can all see that that's going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Mozilla supporting it, I don't, I'm not sure what that means. You know, if I chose to run uh, the, the Firefox browser on my Windows computer or on a Mac or something, does that mean that I could hit a PWA? Mm -hmm. it, it, they'd have to write code that would integrate it with the system. I, it would work in the browser, of course. Of course it would. But, I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's more interesting when it works like an app. Yeah. Because yeah. it is an app, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and no, that requires the platform. I think what's interesting about this is it's more, more user-driven than other technologies have been. Most of the time when you talk about these frameworks, mm -hmm. you're solving a developer's problem. But this actually is, yeah. is cleverly yeah, yeah. designed to solve a user problem, which is... The difficulty of finding something on an app store, downloading it, and installing it, right. having different apps on different platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, it also it, it neatly sidesteps the problem of walled gardens, right? Apple yep. obviously has a, a, a vested interest in their app store and their app platform and all that kind of stuff. Google does, Microsoft does too. Um, what this does is it allows developers to write that one app, which is something like Apple typically in the past would have hated. Right. But mm -hmm. you can target specific platform features and make it unique on that platform, too, which, you know, it's a new Apple, right? Tim Cook is running the show. Things are changing. I mean, hopefully they're not stupid about this. But um, Google and Microsoft are working together on this. I mean, that yeah. alone is a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I know. Uh, so I think anything's possible. Here. Yeah. I mean, Microsoft took some early steps. Remember when they had the bridge, the Westminster Bridge, when they were doing the whole bridging strategy? So that yep. idea was to this take a hosted, website. Yeah, yeah. Web apps. take a website, package it, put it in the store. And a lot yep. of people made apps that way. Um, that probably so, was their most successful bridge to date. Uh, and it's going away, by the way. So <laughs> Right, that's going to go the, away, right? They had literally just shipped or were had completed internally the the ver the first version of that when they found out about PWAs. And they mm -hmm. went to, go that was when they approached Google because they said, it looks like these yeah. things are similar. Mm -hmm. And um, they that's, that was the day they said, we, it's yeah. like we just made this thing and we know we're getting rid of it because we're switching yeah. to PWAs. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I, yeah am, so it, I have drunk your Kool-Aid, Paul. <laughs> and, and I found it to be flavorful. Well, I, I think it's more fair to say that someone else has made Kool Aid, and both of us have found it to be cool and refreshing. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. it's very interesting, and it makes to me it makes a lot of sense. And of course, mm -hmm. the issue, as always with these kinds of things, is can it create performant applications? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, part of it is that it works offline, which is critical, and that's how yep. it's different yep. from the app. We're going to worry about security. Apps. Yeah, they're going to worry about these things looking like security. websites and not yeah. native. Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. How native all are kind, they? Yeah. How performant are they? How secure yeah. are they? All of these things. But I think these mm -hmm. the technologies come a long way. Yeah. Since we talked about this last time. Yeah. No, I mean, look, there are companies that were pioneering uh, that kind of led to this. Netscape, uh, Sun with mm -hmm. Java, obviously. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, Apple. Those even the, the iPhone in a goofy way with the web apps. I mean, these were all kind of steps. Toward you know they yeah. just weren't those things just weren't viable at the yeah. time, mm. uh, and what's changed is mobile. Frankly, um, mobile's mm. changed everything. This is really a response to it's it's mobile yeah. first now. Frankly, and so mm. this is a response to that. It used to be desktop first. Mobile apps were yeah. kind of adjunct. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's mobile. First. I mean, uh, Microsoft has you know it, since Windows eight has tried to bring web developers into the fold. You know, you could write Windows eight apps in JavaScript, HTML five, and and CSS. Um, it didn't work the same way as the other apps as far as like the way you would do layout. You didn't use XAML. You would use, uh, what would you use? Yeah, HTML, whatever it is. I'm sorry. HTML and uh, CSS essentially. So it, it didn't really map. They didn't map to each other. So they were kind of separate things. 
Um, we talked about how terrible those apps were and, and the Chris Jones stuff from the Windows Live guys. They made those first um, mail calendar people app. Those were all HTML5 applications. Mm -hmm. They weren't hosted web apps and they weren't PWAs, but they it was an attempt to you know get developers on those technologies into Windows. Um, it got a little, it, well, probably a lot more sophisticated in Windows 10. But in every case, what you're doing is you're limiting your market to the subset of Windows, which itself is a subset of the wider market. And um, this is exciting because it's it, this will work everywhere. I want to see Untapped make a progressive web app. But that'd be see, a website be, to progress. web app. That would be incredibly easy, simple. actually. Yeah. To untapped it, it is an obvious choice for this. Yeah. That's that's an is, excellent yeah. example of something yeah. that would be a great PWA. Yeah. Somebody asked me today if my uh, website would be a PWA, <laughs> I'm, and I never really, I never thought of it that yeah, way. Don't think and of it is taking a web site and making it an app. That's kind of, mm. that's yeah. that. And I tell you what, the chat room is totally confused by this. That's kind of what they think is happening, and it's yeah. not that at all. In fact, it's not it's like more, that. It's more like using now mature web technologies. Listen, this is what it is. This, this is the simplest way to explain yes, this. Please. If you're going to learn a program today, you're going to write something like an RSS reader, a to-do app, something like that. But you had to write it for a, specific, a particular platform. Now, we're going to be swimming in these apps, but they're going to work everywhere. It's so much better. <laughs> we're still going to have RSS apps and to-do apps, but they're going to be the same on every platform. Well, not exactly the same, I should say. Uh, we talked about the... Um, Mac Office, they made that big announcement. Like we've code complete, you know, we've we've brought all over this cross platform code or whatever. There's probably some tiny percentage of the code in any one of those apps that's totally cross platform. It could literally be a hundred percent with PWA. And the version of Office that you run on the Mac could be the same that you run inside of a web browser on Linux or something. It could be the same that you run on the Windows desktop. They could do this. It's I'm not saying it's gonna be easy, but they could do that. That's exciting. Yeah. It's Should be. be. Yeah, I think so. Well, you know, and uh, unfortunately in this realm, there's a lot of faddish yeah. behavior. And, and it and it could yep. be the, just the flavor of the year instead of something long term. Shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's always that risk. But I, have, I feel yeah. better about this than uh, anything in a long time. I really feel like this yeah. is... Very exciting. I think it's also widely misunderstood. But I think this is one of those things that has been a dream forever. And if you had, mm. if we'd had this discussion in 1999 or in 2003 or whatever year, we would have all agreed that this is a great idea, theoretically. Mm. And here are the reasons why that can't happen. Or here are the reasons mm. why it makes more sense for Windows developers to do this other thing or whatever it might be. There would always be these reasons why. And I think the difference today is that those reasons by and large are going away. There are, yes, there's always reasons to write native code, of course, and not just games, but very specific, uh, not uh, general applications, whatever it is. Um, even within the world of Microsoft, I mentioned .NET versus .NET Core, you know. Um, if you're a Microsoft stack developer, there are going to be reasons to stick with the thing you're using uh, because you're very specifically involved in that world and there are certain things that are not available on the, the .NET Core side. That might change over time, you know, it probably will. Yeah. But right now that makes sense. It's a transition. I think the thing the thing people need to see, and I'm, I'm curious about this, because the first thing that comes into your mind is, so if you do make an app that could run everywhere, is it kind of like a least common denominator thing? Like, is it just going <laughs> to well, be, it, yeah. you have to make a super simple app and you can't have any features that are tailored to the platform at all. And if you make it like that, is it interesting? Because I think untapped right now mm -hmm. is, it might be an Electron app and you know, it looks very much the same on different platforms, right, but right. the old app that they used to have that was tailored more for Windows Phone or for iOS, it was better. And so that's the question well, I have. Okay. I mean, maybe it was better at the time. I, I bet if you were to use that app today and compare it to the one you're using today, you yeah. would say the new one is actually better because it's evolved really? over time. I think so. I kind of hate the uh, new one. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. It's a specific app, but you know, remember the age old problem back in the day with windows phone at the time or windows eight, when that came out, you know, um, the app makers untapped Facebook, whatever they want, their brand is what matters. They want that right. thing to look like their thing. Yeah. Um, the notion that all of our apps on windows have to look the same is one of those things that <laughs> sounds good. It's the reason Microsoft at some point 20 years ago or whatever, made all of the Windows applications, the toolbars and everything, as mm -hmm. close to each other as they could. 
the theory being that if you got used to file whatever, it would always be in the same place. It would make it easier for you to use other apps. If you were a word expert, you could use Excel very easily. Um, when they actually studied that, what they found is that people are actually smarter than that. And they don't need those similarities to exist and that um, there are actually good reasons for apps to look completely different because we have muscle memory. Well, it's just memory, memory, yeah. I guess. But we know that when the pink thing comes up, we're working at Instagram. And we, it doesn't have to have the exact same kind of widgets right. and whatever. Yeah. So uh, native, whatever. I mean, I, I uh, today, these are not PWAs, but I run um, Google Inbox and Google Calendar and Twitter. Mm -hmm. through Chrome as web apps, you know, to yeah. pin to my desktop. There is no jarring experience if I move from, say, Twitter to Adobe Photoshop to Microsoft OneNote or whatever. These are all, they all have their own kind of look and feel. They, I would describe them as native-ish, you know? Yeah. And by the way, for whatever it's worth, I mean, as more and more features come online as... Uh, they don't do this today, but the, the Twitter light app uh, could use Windows 10 mm -hmm. notifications yeah. if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. Right. And that would make it seem, you know, you get that kind of black mm -hmm. panel that slides in when something happens. It's, it yeah. looks like all of the other notifications in Windows 10. That's possible. They could do that right, right. now. It's exciting. Let's take a quick break to talk about our sponsor. We'll have more in just a bit. Paul Therott, Mary Jo Foley, Windows Weekly. On the air, brought to you this week by Rocket Mortgage. Folks at Rocket Mortgage, well, it's, I should really say the folks at Quicken Loan. Uh, Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage because they realized that the, you know, the traditional mortgage process was kind of stuck in the last century. <laughs> it needed a, a customer-focused technological revolution, and that's why they created Rocket Mortgage. Quicken Loans, not a surprise that they've the ones that came up with this number one in customer satisfaction, according to JD power, eight years running people love quick and loans. And now they've taken their platform and made it easy. By the way, we were talking about super bowl ads. I loved Keegan, Michael key in the, um, in the, uh, in the rocket mortgage ads on the super bowl. Did you see that? It was awesome. If you, if you haven't go to YouTube and watch it, it's, I should run it instead of me talking about rocket mortgage, except they want me to tell you about the, the how rocket mortgage works a little bit. So the idea is uh, in the old days to get a home loan, a mortgage or a refi, you'd go to a bank, uh, you'd go and you kind of plead your case. You'd fill out a long application and then you'd go home and you'd have homework. You'd have to get your bank statements from years gone by, pay stubs, all sorts of information, prove your residence, all this stuff. Uh, and that really takes time. The last time we bought a house, for it was four years ago, admittedly, and wasn't with, I wish it had been with Quicken Loans. It was with that big bank that you all know, the one that keeps getting in trouble. The, the, the big bank, uh, did, we did all of that, then we went home, and it took, they kept coming back and saying, well, okay, now we need this, now we need that. By the way, our credit is stellar. It wasn't that. It was just they needed all this paperwork. Fast forward, the next time we buy a house, or if we refi our current house, Rocket Mortgage, you could do it on your phone. And you could do it It's so fast, you could do it on an open house. Not a month to get the loan. Minutes. You go to rocketmortgage.com slash windows. You answer questions you don't even need to look up the answer to. Your name, your address, your birth date, your social, that kind of stuff. They have relationships with all the financial institutions. So uh, you can share your information just by touching a button. And they'll, they'll then they'll crunch the numbers. And, of course, it's all computerized, so it's instant. You know, you go to the bank. I swear to God. And this this was only four years ago. Our The guy was so proud of his specialized mortgage calculator. It was a ca calculator with buttons, not software, not a, not a program. Not a, it was a calculator. They would enter in the... The, the uh, rate, the term, the down payment, and, you go, and then hold it up to you and show you the, the payment. It was good. It was like, dude, <laughs> this is 2017. What are, you, what are you, nuts? Not in Rocket Mortgage. They get all the information. They crunch the numbers. Minutes later, they come up with a bunch of loans based on your income, your assets, and your credit that you qualify for. You choose the down payment. You choose the term. You choose the rate. It's all there on the screen for you to see. Pick the one you want. Press, that's the one I want. They say approved. You can hold up the phone 
Instead of showing you your mortgage payment, hold the phone up to the realtor. Say, hey, we're approved for a loan. We'd like to make an offer. Or you can even, there's a button that says print out a letter if your realtor is also stuck in the last century. <laughs> Rocket Mortgage. I love it. From Quicken Loans. Apply simply. Understand fully. Mortgage confidently. That's their slogan. I'm going to add one more and do it all quickly on your phone, your laptop, your desktop. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash windows, rocketmortgage.com slash windows, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. We thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support of Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat from Thorat.com, Mary Jo Foley from AllAboutMicrosoft.com. Now we kind of get into the weeds. Let's get into the nitty-gritty. We've been very <laughs> high level. We have Let's six minutes to finish the following 2,000 topics. <laughs> go. We it's can like, whip through uh, these. Go. Speed podcasting. <laughs> what do you got? Starting with support changes. Yeah. So these are actually very important, too. Not so much in the weeds as you might think. Okay. Um, so Microsoft had extended support for Windows 10 version 1511 by six months a while ago. And now... No surprise, they're doing the same for the next three versions, 1607, 1703, and 1709. So instead of only supporting these for 18 months, Microsoft is now supporting each of them for two years. This is good news for many IT people because they feel like Microsoft's turning the crank too quickly on these updates and they don't have time to deploy them before they go out of service. I'm guessing this is probably going to be the way they that Microsoft does this from now on. I would think they're, given that they're doing this for all these releases, I would bet we're going to move to a 24-month schedule. You know what's interesting about this story? Yes. As recently as four days ago, this would have been our top story today. <laughs> it would have. How funny, yeah. Because uh, this is actually kind of a big deal. It is a big deal, right. Yeah. It's, a, it's good news for IT people, for sure. Um you know, I think Microsoft did it kind of reticently. They, they're trying to push people to go faster. <laughs> they're like, hey, we want to do this every six months. You guys, yeah. don't you want to do this? Yeah, yeah, no? Okay. Um, yeah, so these these things that come out every six months, these, these things like 1511, 1703, these are called semi-annual channel releases. That's the official name of how they refer to this. So, yeah, you have now have 24 months but oh i should i should be clear you only have the 24 months if you're running windows 10 enterprise or education if you're running home or pro or iot um no you don't have the 24 months you still have 18 but if you're running enterprise or education you you are entitled to these extensions um the other thing to know about extensions well it's not necessarily extensions is you know every every once in a while Microsoft also comes out with what they call the long term servicing channel which is the version of Windows 10 that comes out and they say we're not going to um if you're on this release we're not going to keep updating you all the time it's meant for mission critical systems and things that shouldn't be getting updated uh on a frequent basis so the next one of these on the client side that is coming out will be this fall so probably called um, 1809, um, if they stick with their naming convention, that will be the next uh, long-term servicing channel release of Windows 10. There you go. I I am impressed that you can keep that in your head. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think, <laughs> I don't remember what happened, but at some point they extended the support time frame for, I believe it was Windows 10 version 1511, I think. Yeah. They did. And yeah. whenever that happened, sometime last year, I said, I, last I had one of those, so. yeah, one yeah. of those mark my words yeah. moments. Um, yeah. They're going to do this for every version of Windows 10. And, and that's what this represents, although only for this specific customer yeah. set. It's most important customer set, by the way, mm. um, which I think is the problem with Windows as a service. Ultimately, um, on the good news front, like we've been talking about in the past, they just delivered two major feature updates with a lot of, without a lot of problems. That's amazing. Right. Yeah. On the bad news front, um, the biggest part of their customer, the most important part of their customer base, anyway, the biggest by revenue, uh, doesn't like to upgrade. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. This is uh, kind of indicative of that. Yeah. Um, but I think the bigger, well, not the bigger, but the other big issue here is the stuff that's tied to this, the other side of the coin, the mm -hmm. office side of the coin. <laughs> you yeah. know, so how do we say this? Um, 
Microsoft. Well, here's what I said a, in my headline. Yeah. I said Microsoft's going to tighten the screws, uh, the office support screws. Okay. Yeah, I was trying to, I was trying to think of a polite way to say it. Um, yeah. That's pretty polite, but I mean, you know, like that a is. nice way to say it. Um, what I mean is, uh, Microsoft is trying to convince people not just to upgrade to Windows 10, but to keep going with Windows 10 updates as we go forward. And by people, yeah. I mean companies, um, everybody really, but. Uh, companies are not super interested in this. And so right. they're extending the support for different versions of Windows 10. That's good. I still wonder if there isn't more extension to be had. I mean, I, in fact, by the way, if they extend this one more time, uh, we're out yeah. to a three-year time frame. And remind me again what the old schedule was for new versions of Windows. Every three years. It was once every three years, right? I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> we're going to get right back to where we were. <laughs> but more to the point, um, uh, there are uh, versions of Office, Office 365 Pro Plus, which is the, I guess we could call it Office as a service, right? This is the version yeah. of Office where you get the Office applications, but you license them as, as if they were a service on an ongoing mm -hmm. subscription basis. And then Office 2019, which is the next on-prem version of the traditional Office productivity suite, are now being changed so that they will only work with Windows 10. Mm -hmm. So if... This little support change wasn't enough to make you go over the edge. Uh, Microsoft <laughs> is now tying Windows 10 to Office. And yeah. man, is that, would you say turning the screws, right? That's a pretty good way to look at it. It's, it's turning yeah. the screws. You know, when they announced Office 2019 at Ignite that there would be another on-prem version of Office, I never even mm -hmm. thought to ask them, would this run on Windows 7 and 8.1? I just assumed it of would. Of course it will. It's a desktop suite. Why wouldn't it? Yeah. But it's not going to. Yep. It, it's nope. not. Um, it could. All. I bet it could. <laughs> no. Um, no. Yeah. So if you if you are running Office Pro Plus and you try to run it um, after uh, January 2020 um, on Windows 7, mm -hmm. no, I guess you wouldn't because uh, Windows 7 support hasn't. Yeah, that's but right. Windows 8.1. So Windows mm -hmm. 8.1 supported till 2023. So say you said, hey, I have Windows 8.1. I'm one of those people. I want to run Office Pro Plus on Windows 8.1. You can't. Sure. They're going to not give you any patches. Like, they're just going to stop supporting you. Boom. Dun, dun, dun. Screws tightened. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, yep. here's why they said. They, they say they're, the reason they're doing this is because they're trying to keep people on this fast updating track and that Windows 10 will be in sync with Office Pro Plus and Office 2019. And so you'll get all the best advantages and security and blah and blah. That's their, that's their reason for doing this. But it's also to get people off the platform, the older platforms, for sure. Um, yep. If you're using Office uh, via desktop virtualization or remoting, we don't know what they're going to do, and they were very vague on that. They said, we're going to have more to say this fall about how we're going to support you uh, going forward. So that's all we know on that. Hmm. Huh. There you go. Support in a nutshell. Boom. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Yep. Um... I don't know. Did you did you uh, did you do the proof that Windows as a service cannot work for Microsoft's most important? Yeah, customers? let's we can move on. We We've can. Proven I don't want to beat that one too. All right, <laughs> you've so, proven it. So here's I've proven another. It. Yes, it's a fact. <laughs> it's a fact. Here's another story that might have been top of the charts. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, right. I think Microsoft announced its quarterly earnings last week. <laughs> it did right after we ended the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all old news now. I know. Yeah. Um, what did we learn? What have we learned? Yeah, there's a couple things worth noting from it. So this was uh, their fiscal Q2 for 2018. Um, they had a good quarter, very solid quarter. Um, my my uh, colleague Larry Dignan at ZDNet was looking at the sequential commercial cloud numbers, and he said, you know what? If you look year over year, of course, they're way up on what they're doing in the cloud. But if you look yep. sequentially, they're, it's starting to slow down. And of oh. course, you say, of course, as it gets bigger, it's going to start slowing. But they had Not some softness big. in their bookings. And no. that's kind of interesting. You that don't things want soft slowed. bookings. Oh. So, really? by the way, no um, one wants soft bookings. Mm -hmm. You can also put some <laughs> math to the commercial cloud stuff because obviously Microsoft yeah. always talks about the cloud as the future of the company, but that's what Wall Street wants to hear. Um, yeah. I've argued in the past that this commercial cloud thing is. Not really a thing, right? It's not a business unit. It's right. products and services that they take from different business units, you know, whatever. Um, what you want to do is be able to compare this thing to AWS, right? How is this thing doing? Um, it's hard to compare, but this is uh, one way we could compare it. 
Um, for the quarter ending at uh, end of December, AWS hit $5.11 billion in revenue. Microsoft's commercial cloud, which again, not exactly a, a business unit, hit $5.3 billion. But if Azure, which I think is the thing that most closely aligns to AWS on the Microsoft side, is part of something called Intelligent Cloud. Um, Intelligent Cloud, all of Intelligent Cloud, saw revenues of $2.8 billion. So if you assume that Azure is most of Intel, even if it is all of Intelligent uh, Cloud, Azure at best is about 50% the size of AWS. Yeah. At best. And Azure is definitely not all of, uh, of Intelligent no. Cloud because no. SQL Server is in there too. Yep. SQL's yep. in there. Though. Oh, that's a good that's point. Big. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> I mean, yeah. they could be as little as one quarter the size. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know Azure's numbers at all. But Microsoft has started publishing real numbers instead of run rates for you know what they're doing mm -hmm. in commercial cloud, what they're doing in commercial cloud gross margins, and it looks good. Wall Street likes what they're doing, and <laughs> until the recent stock uh, correction, they were doing well. Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah, there are a couple other th things worth saying about earnings. Yep. Um, yep. Um, Surface Business was up one percent. Um, which surprised a lot of people because they, Microsoft announced four new products last year yeah, in the Surface lineup. Right. Um, and so it's interesting in their holiday quarter, which you would think there'd be a lot of gifting and, and such, they mm -hmm. weren't way up. They were not. It's important to compare that one year over year as well because if you go back right. to the same quarter a year ago, we were at the tail end of a year in which they released no major new products. In fact, we spent the mm -hmm. entire year wondering when they were going to do that, assuming they were going to do it because they had all those reliability problems. And then at, yeah. right at the end of the year, they announced two niche products, uh, Surface Book yeah. with performance base, incredibly, mm -hmm. you know, an expensive version of, the, of Surface Book and Surface Studio, right? Yeah. Um, these two devices account for some uh, less than 1% of Surface usage. They're incredibly low volume devices. Mm -hmm. And yet, in a year in which Microsoft released, what did you say, four major new or at least new Surface Products, products, Surface yeah. laptop, uh, Surface laptop, new Surface mm -hmm. Pro, Surface Book Two in two versions, by the way, and also by the way, Surface Pro with LTE. If you want to kind of throw that out as a separate thing too, yeah. revenues were up one percent, one percent. Yeah, and I, actually there was a number attached to it. Uh, I think it was something along the lines of twenty nine hundred eighty. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me see if I. Why don't I have that right in front of me? Um, Thought it was well it doesn't really matter it's a small business i mean ultimately what yeah. we're coming to here is that um like i said earlier surface laptop has not emerged this is mainstream success story like i thought it was mm -hmm. going to and this thing which is essentially a it's a billion dollar business from sort of a run rate perspective but um in the scope of like pc makers it's yeah. a boutique business hmm. yeah it's really small and you know I, they may be fine with that because they always said, you know, it, we're met, we're running that business to show people what they should build and blah and blah. So I, you know, like, of on. course, you, they'd you like it to have more 1%? money. That has I to know. be disappointing. And but just to be clear, surprising. I mean, I actually would have assumed that this would have been a dramatic increase year yeah. to year. Yeah, I I was a little bit surprised, but also don't forget consumer reports ding them too, and I don't know how much of an effect that had. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Microsoft responded very quickly to this, and, and it's they interesting. I, I think they waited to, um, you know, for their earnings to come out before they did this. I'm sure they had yeah. their legal reasons for it, but they announced yeah. new low end versions of both Surface Laptop and mm -hmm. Surface Book right after they announced these numbers, and you know, to lower the average selling price of the devices because you know, obviously, the problem with the Surface stuff is that it's expensive. These are premium PCs, so I think mm -hmm. Surface Laptop you can get a version that costs. I want to say seven seven ninety nine, and then Surface Book. I believe the lowest end version is now eleven ninety nine. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's earnings. Earnings in a nutshell. Earnings in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Boy, there wasn't much to say. Yeah. Well, you know what? Give it, and I mean, in a different week. Um, in a, you know, We'd top story. We, we we could have spent <laughs> an hour on this. I mean, but. Right. I know. Uh, it's a it's a big business and it's steamrolling along. Um, I think there's some interesting data points, and I think but but we covered you know that we covered. Yeah. All right. Um, Bill twenty eight. We don't know when. 
18. Well, we do know. 20, 20. <laughs> if, that, if that leak is right, right? Oh, there's a leak. Uh, so I've heard this from a separate source. Um, here's okay. the issue. Microsoft had this date for build internally, uh, May 9, uh, 7 to 9. Uh, if you look up Google I.O., you'll see that Google I.O. is at that time as well. Uh -oh. And Microsoft typically yeah, has that. announced the date for build by now, you know, if you, you know, yeah. ahead of time. Uh, they've not done so. I don't know why they waited so long. I know. Now that Google has announced their I.O. date, I maybe they're scrambling to find a different time to do that uh, because yeah. nothing would be more horrible for Microsoft than hosting a developer show at the same time as Google and having a lot fewer people show up because those guys wanted to go to Google. I know. Um, I don't know if that would happen exactly. I'm not sure if um, that many developers would go, would mm -hmm. you know, choose between the two or would go to both or whatever. But they still have not officially announced it. But that's the plan, no. Seattle, uh, early May, and we'll see if it happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, if I were them, you know what? I would do it the week after Google I.O. Mm -hmm. Give them a chance to potentially like scramble to respond. settle down, to right? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, we don't pick the dates. And they still haven't announced. I asked them again this week. So is the, is the leak correct? And they wouldn't say. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, at least it's in Seattle again. I mean, I'm yeah, actually kind of excited about that. Me too. Same. Yep. All right. And finally, a little uh, PUBG news in our Xbox yeah, Mary Jo, this is going to take about 20 minutes, so you don't want to just suddenly... <laughs> <relax. laughs> no, these two, these two are quick. Um, Microsoft this past week, uh, this week, announced an Xbox One S bundle with PUBG, uh, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, right? Uh, it's 290... I'm sorry, it's 199. It's a one terabyte version of the console. It's coming later this month. Who cares, right? Like, what's the big deal? Um, the big deal might be that PUBG is not available as a, it's not a, a completed game. It's in a preview beta version right now. And I'm actually wondering if this release is not tied to the fact that this thing will be coming out of beta, right? But would they or really be Microsoft's about to buy it mm. or that too? That's true, by the way. I'm surprised they that hasn't happened. So anyway, I only note this because it, it's possible that this indicates they're reaching some level of quality soon, and they expect to release the final version. Yeah. Not that it won't keep being updated, but yeah. it's been a kind of a unique release um, so far. The other thing is, uh, I think this might date back to E3 last year, but at some point last year, Microsoft announced a new version of the Xbox wireless adapter. This is a little nubbin you plug into the USB port on your computer so that you can use an Xbox controller wirelessly. They had originally intended to ship it sometime last fall. They delayed it. It's actually available now if you want to buy it. The reason you want this thing is that it works with the new controllers. Um, it's more, it's le it has less latency. Um, and the adapter itself is much smaller. The other thing was this giant candy bar looking thing. This is like a tiny little guy. And um, this is probably the best way to, to do this now okay. going forward. That's it? What's it? Come on. There's got to be something else. <laughs> oh. Sorry. No, 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 no. I'm just teasing Mary Jo. All right. That means the back of the book is coming up. Mm -hmm. That's very good news because it means the show's almost over. That's right. <laughs> oh, no. That's Aww. not good news. No. Uh, the back of the book is our picks of the week, tips of the week, code names, things like that, and beer. Beer is here. But first, a word from... WordPress, our sponsor, WordPress. We know that building something new, something that others connect with, is a lot easier with the right tools, right? Uh, that's why I'm thrilled to have WordPress.com as a sponsor. I use them. I've used them for years. I use them every day. Let me tell you, whether you're looking to help create a personal blog, a website, a business site, or both, creating your website on WordPress.com helps others find you, remember you, and connect you. You don't need experience. You don't need to hire somebody. WordPress.com guides you through the entire process from start to finish. They take care of the technical side, so it's easy to get your site up and running. They have hundreds of beautiful designs to choose from, and you get the features that you know you really need, like that you don't even need to do anything for, like built-in search engine optimization and social sharing. Their business plan lets you access. That's the plan I have, by the way. The hundreds of plugins and themes. Uh, it's worth it, too, because I can bring my own plugins, bring my own themes on my plan. 
Their customer support team, fantastic, made up of WordPress experts eager to help you get the most from your site. And they're there 24 hours a day, Monday through Friday, and weekends too. Plans start at just $4 a month. Come see why 29% of all websites run on WordPress. Get started today with 15% off any new plan purchase. Go to wordpress.com slash windows to create your website and find the plan that's right for you. That's wordpress.com slash windows for 15% off your brand new website. We thank WordPress for their support. Let's kick things off with Paul Therott and his tip of the week. So, uh, Microsoft, in the span of just a few days this past week, released two different ways to get Cortana above the lock screen on your Android device. The first one is the Microsoft Launcher, which, of course, is their replacement for the Android Launcher. Um, that makes sense, right? You, this is like an integrated package. It's like having a Microsoft phone. But they also released an update to the Cortana app. So, if you don't want to use the Microsoft Launcher, but you still want to use Cortana... Now you can get Cortana above the lock screen uh, via an update to the Cortana app. So if you're already using it, you'll get it automatically. Um, that's available now. I actually don't like the way it works, by the way. It's kind of a, you know, those little things they have in Android where you can have like a little transparent circle or whatever, and it moves around the screen. You can put it wherever you want. It's it's that kind of thing. But if you need that's access so to annoying. Cortana, I don't yeah, like I it. don't like it. I don't like <laughs> it. Really, but, but, you know, if you're a Cortana person. Uh, the other thing is it's the beginning of a new month, of course, and uh, we have a new round of games with gold, including, by the way, classic Shadow Warrior, which is one of my favorite PC shooters is out now and Split Second on Xbox 360. And then there'll be two more coming out uh, later this month, one of which is an Assassin's Creed Chronicles game, meaning one of the sideways scrollers, not the full blown Assassin's Creed games. But um, those are pretty cool, too. And da, da, da. oh, my app pick of the week is Opera 51, which just came out today. Um, there, it's funny how they're advertising it. It's um, Opera, by the way, uses the Chrome rendering engine, so it's kind of a way to get Chrome without any of the Google stuff, and it has its own unique UI with social networking integration and other stuff. Um, I kind of I I find it a little busy, although you can customize it however you want. But one of the um, things that's emerged in recent weeks is this thing called. Speedometer 2.0, which is a way to measure the performance of a browser running typical web app technologies. And so I'd, I'd, I couldn't find my results, but I had I had run uh, this test across Chrome, Firefox, and Edge. And basically what I found was that Chrome was faster than Firefox, and both of them were much faster than Edge. <laughs> That's basically the way it worked out. That's interesting, huh? Uh, yeah, so now Opera 51 is touting their gains in this performance test. Of course, they use the Chromium, you know, re web render. So it's probably pretty uh, similar to what you see in Chrome. But what they're saying is that they are approximately, I think it's 38, is that the right number? Yeah, 38% faster than Firefox. So one of the big reasons someone might have switched to Firefox over the past couple of months is that the latest versions of Firefox offer dramatically better uh, performance that Firefox had in the past and better resource usage than Chrome. Um, I did use it for a couple of months. I ended up switching back for a variety of reasons. The big one being that I'm still running Chrome anyway. So it's, you know, it just going between two different browsers got kind of tedious. But um, if you want the benefits of Chrome without a lot of the Google baloney, um, this might be something to look at, uh, just if only for the performance aspect of it. That's their selling point. All the benefits of Chrome without the Google Baloney. Without the, without the Google BS, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I should be a marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Jo Foley, let's uh, do it. The Enterprise Pick of the Week. Um, if you are a business with 500 users or more, mm -hmm. and you are not currently a OneDrive... Have I got a deal for you? Have <laughs> <laughs> I got a deal for you? <laughs> I, I, if you're not a, currently a OneDrive for business customer or an Office 365 customer, Microsoft is going to make you a little deal. Starting February 6th, which was yesterday until June 30th, you can, if you have Box, Dropbox, or a Google Drive in your company, uh, use this new switching offer that Microsoft has to get OneDrive for Business for free Ooh. for the duration of your contract up to three years with any of those vendors. So, you know, this is a pretty specialized case. It, you have to be a brand new customer. You um, still have to pay for your existing contract with one of those vendors if you have one. But you can start using OneDrive for Business for free just to see how it works. And Microsoft thinks 
if you do that and you happen to use other Office apps or Office 365 apps, that you might be a good candidate to switch. Mm -hmm. So I, I was actually interested to see them do this switching campaign because it felt like for the past year or so that they were kind of rolling over for their competitors, I thought, in the cloud storage space. You know, they were doing deals with Box, deals with Dropbox, being all partner happy, partner centric. And, and it was like, okay, do you guys actually want someone to use OneDrive or do you not really care? So it shows there's still a little fight left in Microsoft in this space. Um, I've got a post on my site with a link to where the switching offer is and you know some of the fine print around if you're an EA customer and such. Uh, but you know it could be a good deal for people who aren't already OneDrive for business customers. Right. So give it give it a right. check out. Cool. And uh, well, if we've uh, done the uh, enterprise pick of the week, I think it must be codename uh, pick of the week, huh? Yes. Yeah. So we had Polaris as a big topic on Windows Weekly recently, and we talked about Polaris being the code name for the desktop shell for Windows 10 in the future. I got a tip right after that. You know what? There's another Polaris at Microsoft. This is not the only Polaris. And um, listener Scott Dines sent me a link to a GitHub project. There is another Microsoft Polaris. Polaris is also a cross-platform minimalist web framework for PowerShell of course that's built is. on .NET standard. So just to make things extra confusing, there are now at least two Polaris projects at Microsoft um, that have absolutely nothing to do with each other. This Polaris <laughs> is the one that is about PowerShell. How funny. Oh, how funny. Yeah. 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 All right. So another Polaris is the codename of the week. We'll start, we'll start with that. Uh, finally, let's have a little beer. Yeah, I feel like I've been doing a lot of heavyish beer picks lately. Um, <laughs> so I said, you know, let me go down to a 5.9%, something more drinkable, uh, yet very tasty. So if you've ever had any of the Boulder Brewing beers, they're excellent from Colorado. There is a beer called the Boulder Shake Chocolate Porter that is delicious. Yum, yum. It tastes like chocolate, as you might imagine from the name. And the reason it tastes like chocolate is kind of cool. Um, it uses cacao nibs in the beer, but also chocolate wheat. Ooh. So it comes out really dark, chocolatey. C Some people say cacao? caramel. Cacao? Is that how you say it? Cacao. It's like a, it's like a skit from, uh, what's that movie? Uh, Coco. Is that how you say it or yes, not? Yes, that's cacao. how you say it. Cacao. cacao. Are you making fun of me, Mr. P. Interest? <laughs> cacao. It's called, <laughs> what did you think it was? Cocoa? Cacao. Cacao. It's the bean, <laughs> not cocoa. Cocoa right. is a cacao derivative. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not actually debating how it's pronounced. It don't, just don't. I thought you were making fun of me. Second guess <laughs> Foley. She knows whereof she speaks. <laughs> yeah. So it's if you if you guys see it, they they bottle and distribute widely, and it's a really nice beer. It's Boulder Shake Chocolate Porter. Yum yum. Yeah. Yum and it's yum. full of cacao. Cacao. Cacao phony. Yeah. It's delicious. <laughs> oh, hi, cacao. <laughs> so, uh, yes. with Jamie Lee Curtis and John Cleese. Cacao me. Cacao me. Cacao kapow. With the stutterer. Cacao. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that concludes uh, this fabulous, fabulous edition of uh, Windows Weekly. Cacao. As often has the case. We have uh, Im impressed all and sundry with Mary Jo Foley and Paul Thorat's <laughs> grasp of the fundamental issues at hand <laughs> and their deeply wow. eloquent exposition on all matters. Red Cacao. Mundo. Cacao. <laughs> Cacao. Cacao. Come on. Now I'm going to be self-conscious about how Cacao. I pronounce it. No, no, I'm sorry. I, you are obviously pronouncing it correctly, but what the heck is that movie with... <laughs> the british thing with the cacao? ken you're stuttering the what is i don't know a fish mind. called wanda oh yes, yeah it's you. ken stuttering ken Boom. yes isn't that a, isn't that like a skit from that movie it's like yeah. cacao cacao <laughs> cacao cacao they're bean like seeds from which cocoa cocoa butter and chocolate are made cacao yep a small I will be vindicated on this. A small <laughs> tropical evergreen tree that bears these seeds, which are contained in large oval pods that grow on the trunk. Cacao. She's <laughs> vaguely creepy. It is vaguely. That is entirely, pretty creepy. Entirely. Yeah, it's it Cortana's is. cacao. 
Uh, Cortana is a cow. No, no, that we wouldn't. <laughs> Paul Thurot is at Thurot.com, T H U R R O double good.com. That's where he, Brad Sams, and many others pen their way to literary <laughs> success. And they fight fires and, also. And boy, they have a great costume department. Just a reminder, he had the option not to post that publicly. Yeah. It's so but cute. But knowing that he did. He chose to do that. We kind of begs. Little, uh, it's, 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 it's little Brad. Little Brad. Happy at he last. Well. Uh, he also publishes the books, not Brad, Mr. Theron, <laughs> at, uh, at leanpub.com. Mary Jo Foley is at allaboutmicrosoft.com. That's her ZDNet blog. They uh, convene each Wednesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. That would be 1900 UTC to uh, to deliquate and escalate the exacerbation of Windows and its siblings. I'd like to parse that for a few seconds. That doesn't but even I'll... make sense. I just <laughs> threw in words that make no sense. If you wish to join them, please tune in live at uh, twit.tv slash live round about that time. Or... You can be in the chat room at irc.twit.tv. They're already thinking of exciting new titles for the show. Uh, you can also <laughs> you can also watch on demand after the fact. We have, uh, of course, every show ever made at twit.tv slash ww all five hundred fifty six episodes. Because Paul and I started doing this when we were in our teens. Yeah. That's right. And uh, a lot of towel snapping in the gym mm -hmm. at high school when we started. <laughs> cacao, cacao. <laughs> we, we also are in every podcast platform possible iTunes, Overcast, Pocket Cast, you know, just subscribe. That way you'll have every episode of Windows Weekly. The minute it is made available on the interwebs. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mary Jo. We'll see you next week on Windows Weekly. Cacao, cacao.